Next on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the meeting of March 8th, 2023. So moved. We got a motion from Ms. Wagner. Second. Matt. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, now we have on the agenda public comment. Do we have any? None. Nobody signed in. Member comments. Nobody? All right. Uh, next, moving on to interviews for various fire protection, I'm sorry, fire protection district boards, including Fox River Grove, McHenry, Harvard, and Crystal Lake. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and follow the list that we have here. Um, and we have uh, first for Fox River Grove Fire Protection District, uh, Mr. I'm sorry, I say the name wrong. Yokius. Yokius. Please step up. Uh, why don't you sit right here, close to the microphone? Right here. That'll work too. All right. Morning. 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 <coughs> And if you want to go ahead and uh, start with a quick introduction. All right, uh, William Yoshis, Bill Yoshis, uh, been a county resident for going on 40 years or so, was the uh, mayor of Fox River Grove back in the early 90s. Had a full head of hair and skinny young man, so a lot has changed since then. Uh, so been a resident a long time. Uh, been on the fire district, fire department since 2004. So it'll be 19 years this year. We've done a lot of good things. Uh, really solid department. We've got great folks that work for us. Great chief, uh, great officers. And it's been a pleasure to serve that department for all well, these many years. Any questions? Mr. Sager? Thanks for your continued public service. We appreciate it. My that. pleasure. Um, you had a, we had a nice letter, I think, from uh, the president of your district. Is it Mike? My Kunz, yep. Right. And uh, he pointed out, I think, probably uh, three different really significant issues that uh, I know that a number of districts face. One of them is a small rural district because you are so incorporated in the area, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing. As a result, you have a small financial base, if you will. Second thing has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, there has been talk of consolidation uh, and yet that's a very slow process uh, and so trying to keep things moving forward in the light of that large discussion but then the third thing happens to be uh, the question of is there any ongoing effort with regards to the state legislature uh, regarding that question of consolidation and so that's out there your opinion please of consolidation I mean, that's, that's that's probably the most important thing in the fire district right now and and kind of what drives that is everybody's seeing the same thing right it's a lack of staffing lack of qualified people to serve in those roles and paramedic is a, you know a very unique skill and it requires a fair bit of education and those kind of things so we're seeing there just aren't the number of people that have volunteered to become paramedics to, you know you got to go through a year of training uh, and then what we have found you know as you mentioned as a small district we'll train them We'll have them staff for a while, and then they'll find a job in Hoffman Estates or Palatine or something like that, you know, with a, an Article Four pension and, and obviously a much larger pay, and we just we can't afford that. So what's the answer? I mean, how do we get around that? And, and the answer is probably to consolidate a lot of the districts that are out there. Now, we, as a board, have been working on some of those consolidation efforts, but absent a, I'll call it a, a mandate from the state saying that you need to consolidate that you know what we went through with the dispatch centers is we had everybody had a dispatch center and then the state came in and said okay we're going to have three in McHenry county and that's it and so we were kind of forced to consolidate and that kind of makes you do the things that you have to do absent a state requirement like that you know we've got a different tax rate than carry you know, the, the most logical move for us would be to consolidate with carry and we've talked and we've worked toward consolidating response without really being consolidated. So if we actually wanted to be a combined district, 
we'd have to get our voters, we'd have to get carry voters to say, yep, that makes sense, let's do that. Now, absent a requirement to do that, our tax rate is different than Carrie's tax rate. Um, Carrie's revenue is significantly more than what we have. So it makes it difficult for our voters to say, yeah, that's, let's become part of that. And then Carrie's saying, well, you know, we don't want to have to take on any financial burden from doing that. So that makes it all difficult. So what can we do in the meantime? I mean, we're doing the work that we can as best as we can to work on a multiple response plan where Carrie helps us out, we help Carrie out. We help Barrington Countryside out, they help us out. So we, you know, we and the fire service have been doing this uh, Mavis thing for a long time and it's just kind of an extension of that. It's just, can we make it more, more regular, more planned so that we can, we can solve some of these staffing issues by doing some of that kind of stuff, sure. Well, I can assure you that uh, most units of local government uh, have the same challenges that you have just expressed with regards to you all as a smaller community training individuals to come forward and then you know they're, they're kind of uh, robbed if you will mm -hmm. of that uh, expertise because they're moving on to other other locations uh, police departments suffer from exactly the same yeah. same type of attrition so that's a problem um, I appreciate it very much obviously you've had a tremendous number of years of service publicly and not just with the fire district we're grateful for that and uh, I have no further questions great thank you any other questions? I did, but that got answered. Oh. So. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. You know me. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you. Much. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Next on the interview list, Joseph Doherty for McHenry Township Fire Protection District. You are correct. <coughs> Joe Doherty, very nice to meet all of you. Last time I did this, it was over the home line. So I appreciate coming up here today to see all of you. So I've been on the um, McHenry Township Fire District um, trustee for three years. Um, I spent my entire life in McHenry, born and raised in McHenry. I'm still there. I have a wife and two daughters, Casey and Delaney, and my wife, Kim. Um, so in 1984 to 1998, I worked at the McHenry Police Department um, Dispatch Center. Um, we we're bringing in in-house computers and that type of thing. I was doing the MDT installs and uh, um, the chief at the time, Patrick Joyce, he put me on the uh, initial 911 board when we first started it up for, for McHenry County. So, um, so that was my life short at um, McHenry City Police. Um, so I spent 14 years there. So my life took a new direction in 1998. Um, I opened up Fast Eddie's Car Washes, and uh, they're 25 years last year, or this year, one or the other, this year. So, um, you know, I, I have like 90 employees. I do the day-to-day, -day, the hiring, the banking, the payroll, um, everything you'd want to do in a small business. And, and that's where I said my strong point is on this, not so much... Um, uh, the firefighter end of it, but the business side of it, um, I see that a little more clearly. I know there's uh, challenges with um, the hiring process now because there's not enough people in any positions out there to do things. But uh, you know, I'm just here to give back a little bit. Life's been pretty good to me, and um, uh, that's kind of what, uh, what I'm doing. Um, I like to keep the bar raised. Um, I know at uh, Fire Department, Henry, you know, it's, it's kind of like how I like things to go. You know, buy new, um, have the best, you know, just go right down the, down the line like that and, you know, kind of raise the bar a little bit. Um, good morning. morning. How are you? Sorry. Oh, no problem. No <laughs> I've had problem. better mornings. <laughs> um, but I always had a passion for the EMS services. Um, um, the current trustees do an excellent job, I think, and, uh, and it's a good fit for all of us. Um, uh, my goal is, you know, just to have be win-win, you know, between the employees, the taxpayers, and the fire district. Um, I pay seven real estate bills myself, and, and I know those get a little heavy sometimes. So I'm always looking out for the, the dollars there. Um, you know, I could go on a little bit about the um, 
fire district and us being the second busiest and uh, the best of it as far as uh, watching the tax um, rate and tax base. You know, we've, out of 14 departments, we're the third lowest, which uh, I think is great. Um, we were estimated to go to 10,000 calls by 2025. Um, well, this was interesting. I, I thought this was really good. Last month, we had 45 firefighters apply for 12 full-time positions. <clears throat> we kind of shook up the um, business a little bit, and we, we said, well, hey, let's, let's do a hire maybe a firefighter. Most of them hire like EMTs. But if we get them early enough, let's pay for their schooling, hang on to them a little bit longer, and uh, you know, if they leave early, they gotta pay us back, some, work some business deal out like that. And uh, thus we get 45 um, applications for 12 positions. So yeah, let's shake up the box a little bit. And uh, contract, we tried to do contract employees, and that did not work. There wasn't much interest in that. But we tried it, and at least we tried. We tried doing the right thing for the taxpayers. Um, so bottom line, we run the business like it's our own. So um, any questions? My apologies to all of you. Um, my rental car decided, I think, that I used it too much and it was tired this morning. So, um, but it did start and I am here, so I apologize. Are there any questions for Mr. Doherty? Mr. Sager. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of levity. I appreciate, Joe, we had a chance to visit just a little bit out in the parking lot, but I uh, appreciate all the family uh, service throughout the <laughs> generations that you all have provided to the community at large. Thank you. Um, and, and this is the question first. Um, you own Fast Eddie's. Why not Fast Joe's? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a the story of my wife. Sorry, right, here's the Fast Eddie's story. Okay. All right, so her grandfather... Um, he was a factory worker, and he didn't care much for working much. And uh, he, when he was there, they'd call him Fast Eddie because he was kind of a slow-moving guy. And it's kind of a catchy name, and uh, that's where that name came from. Very good. Paul Colmer was his name. Very good. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a fun story to tell. Isn't it? Um, with regards to uh, McHenry, you all obviously have um, a very large district compared to a lot of the other districts that are out there. Um, you have the capacity to, to bring people in at the uh, firefighters position and then train them um, and perhaps then they're going to stay with you. What is you all's perspective in terms of that retention? What is it that you're going to do to, to make sure that they're going to stay with you? Well, they know we have great training there because it's a great training ground in the departments around the area and uh, I think outside of the area too. Um, know that if they're going to get a, a good firefighter, they're going to pull it from a cannery. So we, we really um, do well there. We try to keep as many as we can, but you know it, it just go, keeps going up. The dollars amount keeps going up because of the shortages of firefighters. So you got to pay more. You got to you got to keep up with the Joneses on that end. So you know, just having the best usually will keep the people there. Um, but there's always the ones that you know that would rather leave for one reason or another. How do you perceive that the consolidation of the uh, dispatch has worked in the county as that might relate to consolidation of fire districts? I think it worked very well. Because I, I know it, when they started that, they're like, oh no, you know, so I live over in Huntley and, you know, how is someone answering the phone in, you know, Woodstock and I know what's going on over here. That was a big concern. But now I think that as people realize how computers work, those centers, and it's very, very accurate, I think that it would be an easier sell than it was years ago. 
They've already gotten a point for me because you mentioned Woodstock at least once in your conversation. <laughs> <laughs> once in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Any other questions? Just Ms. Wagner? Besides staffing, what is the greatest challenge of the fire district? Or what do you well, see as the fire Kind of getting equipment is a big deal, too. Some of the engines, and we've got four ambulances on, on order right now. We pay for it when we get them. You know, it's, it's not, we don't take loans on anything. But um, the fire trucks and engines are like two years for um, you know, a wait on those. So that's, that's another tough one. Is that something new? That longer wait? Is that a supply chain issue? Or really? is that something that we've always. Yeah, that's pretty It much is it. relatively new. Thank you. Just out of curiosity. I'm sorry, Ms. Wagner. Any more questions? Anyone else? Thank you very much, Mr. Jody. We really appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. Thanks. I, I don't know if anyone noted, but we do have representatives of the township production. We have the fire chief as well as the president of the board here, too, if you have any other questions outside of that. So, do you want to continue or do you no. want to? <laughs> do you want me to go on? So, um, the next individual on um, our agenda is James Altoff. He is in the audience. Mr. Althoff, would you like to um, take a seat? Kind of tell us about um, yourself, why you're interested in this position, any history and connection you might have to the Fire Protection District, and then um, some of your own goals of, of what you see yourself giving to the um, sure. organization. Um, I grew up in McHenry, born and raised, and uh, one of seven kids. My father, James Althoff, he was on the trustee with the fire department for over 30 years and a president for over 20. Um, I was on the fire department from 83 after college until 87. Um, I had to stop doing that when I went to play in the NFL. They don't allow you to do those, both of those things. So they don't like that uh, dangerous kind of stuff. Um, so after that, I started my own business, which I run up, up to this day, which is drug and alcohol testing programs for trucking and construction all around the uh, northern Illinois area. Um, I've always loved the fire service. I've always been involved with it because of my father. And then I loved being a fireman as well. My two older brothers were firemen. Uh, my uncle was a fireman in McHenry. So been around it a long time. Um, and I know my dad Rest his soul with love for me to see me look down and see me following in his footsteps to be a trustee as well. So, uh, with that being said, um, I think the, they've done a wonderful job so far uh, with, with the fire department and I'm very proud of it. And I know the citizens are proud of it. Um, some of my goals that I'd like to see um, is I kind of keep track of the minutes and what's going on in the meetings. So, I know we're renovating Station 2, that's up and coming. Um, the new Station 6, um, when that finally gets built, that'll be the second busiest station in the district. So it's obviously necessary to get that going as soon as possible. Um, I know we're hiring 12 additional full-time firemen, paramedics, so that'll be a bit of a challenge financially. Um, I know the department is in good shape financially. Um, I would like to see um, us look into the safer grants from FEMA, which are available for fire departments. Some of our neighbors, Huntley has received over three, four hundred thousand. Wakanda's received um, similar. Uh, Waukegan has received over a million. All those monies are available for retention and hiring of firefighters. So that would be very interesting for us. That would also help with our ease on some of our financial issues. Um, I know the fire department has not gone in for over 20 years um, for any additional tax money. And I think that's, especially with the state of the economy right now, with people struggling, I think we gotta be really smart fiscally and not make that move anytime soon. So if we can find additional monies, like with safer grants, I think that would be outstanding for us. Um, something else that I'd like to see is I'd like to see a bigger social media presence. And by that I mean, um, you look at the, the website and the Facebook page, it's all great, but there's so much more, I believe, the fire department could do for the community. And by that I mean maybe filming some of our training programs so, that, so the community can see what they're doing. Because they can't usually go out and watch training. But if they can see what, what's going on and what's going on behind the scenes, 
um, there's so many avenues that we could do. We could have all kinds of little demonstration videos online that you could say, okay, if your child is choking, here's the first steps. You call 911, here's what else you need to do. Or you have a fire or a, you know, a stove fire. You have this, you have that. Um, lawnmower in the garage on fire. There's so many little videos and training things that we could offer the community that they don't do yet. Um, and I think that would be super helpful. Um, something else is I think that the public should know that there's safety audits or inspections that you could have at your house. So you could have a fire inspector come to your house and walk through and say, okay, this might be something you want to look at. You know, how's your smoke detectors? How's this? You know, do you have kids in the house? Do we have an evacuation plan? What do you have ready to go in case you do have an emergency? Um, we could have maybe little handout kits to the families uh, with a smoke detector and a few other things. Um, and that's something that the fire inspectors could schedule on their own so they don't get inundated with a thousand inspections when they have other inspections to do throughout the, you know, the district. So I think that would be really something that the public would like to see. Um, I know they have the open houses, which are amazing, um, and they get a good turnout for those. But I just think with everything being social media these days, I really would like to see a bigger footprint in that area. I think that would be really cool. And there's so many things that we could do with that. Any questions for Mr. Alto? <coughs> Mr. Coco? What and then Ms. Wagner. Sorry. What do you feel you bring to the table on the union issue of the part-time employees and on the grant issue? Do you bring something extra to the table for either of those issues for us? Well, I, um, being in the, um, working for my father, we had multiple unions that we dealt with, plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians. So I am familiar with that, and I deal with a lot of unions right now with my business in regards to drug and alcohol testing, because most of all my testing is with CDL drivers and operators. So I do deal with the unions quite often on the collective bargaining agreements, so I have some, some knowledge base in that regard. Um, and I, I feel like instead of working against the union, we should try to find a way to work with them because I have friends in the department and um, the unions are very anti-part-time, as you guys know. They don't want part-time firemen working from other full-time departments. So they're sending out letters telling them, no, you can't, to the firemen, you can't work anymore part-time at McHenry or where have you. And this is, this is a public safety issue and we should not be button heads with the unions over a public safety issue not a truck driver or an operator or something like that. This is much more important to the communities, especially these part-time guys are living in our community uh, for the most part. And it would be nice if we could find a way, some sort of a even ground with the unions and I'll get this to be allowed because it would make things a lot easier for everybody. That's your question. Ms. Wagner. It was kind of answered, but just what I'm surprised you guys had so many people come out to interview for those 12 positions. Um, what else would you do to attract um, employees or prospective employees? Well, I think that if you can, um, as, as Joe alluded to, um, start bringing in guys and develop and train them. I think if we can do more programs working with um, high schools and colleges and getting those kids interested, um, and starting to build a program from the ground up, bringing those kinds of kids, community kids in, and getting involved with the fire department. And I think they do some of that now, but it would be great to expand that program and start bringing kids in and with a cadet kind of situation and get them interested. Because I don't think a lot of kids really um, and just look at the fire service as a career path. And they don't understand how uh, wonderful it can be. When you're working, all, you know, you can get a great salary, base salary, working in the fire service, and you can move your way up through the ranks, and you can do very, very well, and end up with a great pension. And uh, so I think it's really important to start training these kids, not only on the good they're doing, but how good it can be for them personally. And I don't think, I don't really think a lot of kids understand that. Because that it is a great career path. Mr. Sider. Um, can you describe the relationship between the McKinney County District and uh, MCC in terms of training efforts there? 
is there an outreach program? Is there a collaborative? Uh, since uh, I'm not on the board program? currently, um, I'm not completely familiar with mm -hmm. that, to be honest with you, Brian. Um, so I apologize for that. But um, I know that they do have training classes going on and college, college classes offered right now in, in firefighting. Um, how much are we directing these guys back to McHenry or are there other departments directing me there? I don't, that I can't answer for right now. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question is, there's no answer to this, so I apologize for that. But, um, you know, we seem in almost all levels of, especially in uh, emergency services, to be looking at grants to supplement the needs that we have financially. I mean, everybody keeps looking for grants, and, and you mentioned this, and it's really important, and I agree that that's an opportunity, a source of funding, but ultimately, those are still going to be temporary, and they Correct. only fill voids for a short period of time. And the other thing is taxation, right? So we don't, any of us want to raise taxes more, so what is the answer? Where do you find that balance? What are the opportunities that exist? And well, again, I'm not sure there's an answer to any of that because that's the I same question that, we all have about everything. You know, that, that FEMA money is out there and it's available. Um, applying for it and trying to get to offset some of the costs right now, especially in a, in a situation where we're hiring additional full time and probably going to do more so when Station 6 gets online. So we're going to have to have more and more people full time, which is, as you know, very expensive. So if we can offset that initial costs right now and not have to go back for a referendum and get additional monies out of the taxpayers, um, I don't know what the numbers are, but I would like to see how many people were late with their property taxes this year because the economy is so terrible. And you know, how people are struggling. I don't have to tell you, you, know, you go to the grocery store, you know how much groceries have gone up and going to the gas pump. And I feel bad for a lot of families because they are really fighting right now. And to go back and say, okay, we're going to go back for you know another percentile points or something um, for the fire department, it, everybody's looking at every dime now where it used to be not such a big deal. So if we can get to a point where we can just get a little buffer for a few years to offset some of those costs, right, I think that it's definitely worth looking into because if, if we don't go after it, somebody else is, if that money's sitting there, um, yes, I agree with you. It's still getting paid for by the taxpayers. Obviously, every every t every dollar that the government has comes from us. So, uh, but I just think it's an opportunity to take advantage of, like Wakanda has, like Huntley has. Thank you. You didn't mention Woodside, but you did NFL, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the Bears are looking much better. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, um, yes, Miss Campbell. All right, so this might be more um, general, so about McHenry in general, but um, so whereas Fox River Grove is part-time um, district, you have full-time mm -hmm. um, uh, firefighters there, but we still you still have an issue with retention, right? So um, where are they largely going? Are they going to much bigger um, communities? Well, or as, is as you know, there's a lot of, there's places like Hoffman Estates, for example, so, okay, so that are paying quite a bit more from a base, pers base salary perspective than McHenry is. Right. But if you have local kids, um, and I'll use um, Marcus Heeman, Tony Heeman's son, for example. Both his sons are firefighter paramedics. Marcus left, got his training, worked part-time with McHenry, and left and went to a Glenbrook for a while and was full got hired full-time there, which is an outstanding opportunity. Mm -hmm. But here's a kid that has such good community roots that he thought about it and decided, no, he quit Glenbrook very shortly after being hired full-time there, which was his dream to get hired full-time somewhere like that. And he came back for less money to be in McHenry because he loves the community so much. So if we can really get to a point where we're get, retaining the community members that are, as firefighter paramedics and getting them involved in the community, I think like somebody like a Marcus Heeman, I mean, he's doing outstanding, that's the kind of people we should be going after in the tech routine. Um, and then just one other thing. It, well, I also think that it's not always about the money, so to your point. I agree, right. Sometimes it's, it's other opportunities that are available. Um, and I should know this, but the pension, um, it, the, at one time long ago, police and fire pensions was unique to the municipality or whatever. So is that still the case, or does this move with them when they move? I believe they can recruit. <laughs> Rudy? The, um, 
the state chain made changes Rudy, in the last Rudy, couple of years. Introduce we yourself. I apologize. Introduce yourself. So oh, I, 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 I am very sorry. Thank you. Um, my name is Rudy Horst. I'm the fire chief for the McHenry Township Fire Protection District. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a consolidation was made for the uh, individual fire department pension funds as far as the dollars and for the investment. Each individual community, each individual district maintains their pension board for other functions, but a pooling of the money was done for investment purposes. And that, that really just started within the last year or so. Can they take that pension with them if they go somewhere else? Or you know There are saying? avenues for uh, what's called reciprocity, to where if a firefighter is full-time in another community uh, and is earning pension credit, and then he goes to another community, because statewide, uh, we all follow the same laws for the pension. Mm -hmm. uh, there are opportunities for that uh, credit to be transferred. There are some, some, some limitations and some requirements with that, and the individual ends up paying a little bit more into their pension for that kind of dual administration of it. But yes, there are opportunities for their reciprocity. Right, so it's still not like I'm rough that just follows you around. But no, it's, it's a little bit no, little it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. But, okay. the, but the intent is there. Okay. The, the actual intent is there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Altov? Jim, you're welcome to hang around and okay. hear deliberations if you'd like to do that. If not, you can watch it online, listen to it. Or um, we'll call you directly after two. We have yeah, several options. Fine. We'll stick around for a little bit, then I have some work things to attend. Thank you. But thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And next on our agenda, and I see him in the audience, is Robert Meyer, also for um, McHenry Township Fire. Um, Bob, can I ask you to take a seat? And following the same kind of format, if you can tell us um, a little bit about your history with the fire. Protection District, and then why you want to continue in your position and some of your own individual goals for the next couple of years. Well, I'm, Pardon me? I'm working on my 65th year with the fire department. 29 years, John, for the rescue squad. 36 years with the fire district as a trustee. And uh, I'd like to go one more time. And, and do you want to also explain why you do want to go one more time and, and the um, challenges and the opportunities that you see that you want to address specifically? Well, it, to me, it's the most active fire department in the, in the state. And the, the challenges are all laid out there uh, in our planning process and that our strategic plan, we have a uh, an itinerary of what we are to accomplish and the, the number of accomplishments uh, everything from new doors at station one and station two to remodeling to new, uh, the possibility of station six in McHenry but we don't want to go ahead with that until we're certain that we can staff it that we have the manpower to staff it. And uh, we're on the road to that uh, end. Uh, in fact, there's 12 more people going to be interviewed for the possibility of full-time fire department. Eventually, it's going to be a full-time fire department. But the transitioning factor is it's difficult. It's, it's, it's got to pull a lot of magic. And, uh, I did graduate from college uh, with a master's degree, but that's one subject that I, I either missed or failed or they didn't teach. <laughs> and um, I, we did receive a letter from board president, Mr. Miller, that indicated that you were terribly engaged with the capital development um, and the construction of um, a couple of the stations. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? The new station six, and I think what was the last one that was built? The actual building of station six. Yeah. Was all, uh, you, 
actually talked about the station. Well, we we have we have currently we have prop, property in two places to build station six, one on Bull Valley Road and the other one out on Route 31. The Bull Valley Road is a basically it's up for sale and it's it's not really feasible for us to build out there right now. Property on 31 is across from the old Ramada Inn, and uh, we're working with the city of McHenry and that on the zoning and this and that. We would expect to uh, you know, finalize that work by the city council and uh, go ahead with the, the possible permitting and this and that of the, for the building. But there's it's, it's a ways off. It's a, it's a good year, year and a half off before you know we could see the structure. But back five, six years ago, we did a study and uh, on Station Six, and we found out that the businesses that are out in the corporate center could actually be saving about 25 percent of their insurance money if there was a station out in that area. And that's one of the big goals that we have. We're always interested in cutting the taxes and maintaining a very feasible fire department, reliable. Great. Um, anything else you want to say, Mr. Mayor, before we open it up for questions? I'm sure I, can. I, I said, is there anything else that you would like to share with the committee before we open it up for questions? No? Questions for Mr. Meyer? Was, just what was, was that um, is Station 6 north of 120? No, it's south. South of 120? It's south. Okay, it's, yeah. Okay, sorry. Th those, those of us old McHenry's yeah. know what he's referencing when he says the old Ramada. It's the, the, the MCC Business Center now. Oh, sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'll say it. <laughs> Please, Ms. Wagner. How, how long have you been on the Fire Protection District? Yeah, 29 years with John Ford Rescue Squad. In 1987, early 88, we merged, we sold off the fire department, and I've been a trustee from that point on. So 36 years, so this year is my beginning of my 65th year. True public service. <coughs> That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sager? Appreciate that uh, tremendous uh, length and tenure of public service, so thank you I'm very I'm much. Sorry. Thank you for that public service. We appreciate that tenure uh, that you have served the district, so thank you. Uh, question is, can you identify what the interaction or collegiality is between McKinley County College training programs in fire science and the district. Do you have a collaborative effort there that you uh, continue to foster? I don't really understand that. McKinney County College has a fire science program Correct. there. And can you tell me, is there a relationship between the college training program and McKinney County Fire District uh, to try to uh, have interns or bring people into um, the profession in McHenry from MCC? We work jointly with the college. We have a lot of, a lot of their students are from McHenry and striving to become a McHenry firefighter and that. But overall, the training in that, we we foresee in, a, in the very near future a, a, a new training institute, fire tower, this and that, where there's more application, mm -hmm. where they, than what they're currently getting at the college. And that's not downing their program at all. Sure. It's a wonderful program that they have. And that institute would be a state institute? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Matt, do you have anything? Mr. Cook. Good, good. Good. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Meyer. You can stay and listen to our deliberations, or you can excuse yourself and watch us on uh, the computer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we've got a little bit of time. I mean, Alan, um, Chief, do you have anything that you wanted to add about, you know, strategy or challenges or goals? Or I apologize. I just was going to let um, the board president say something. Okay. He's here. I apologize. No, I just, <clears throat> Pam, as you know, I've been with the district for 33 years now also. I've been the president of the board for 25. And I think McKinley has the best fire district in the county and probably the state. We're very financially sound. We watch our taxpayers' dollars very closely. Most of the board is business people. We do have one, one board member is a full-time firefighter in another area. Uh, I'm very proud of our district. Like, like Bob said, we're, we're looking at building our station six, but that's, that's, a, that's a big project. That's a $6 million project. We do have the funds to build it, but we're not going to do it until we're sure we can staff it. So the last thing we want to do is spend $6 million on a building and we can't put people in. We have, in the last three years, converted from a full part-time department to a, a combination. We now have 24 full-time blue shirts, six full-time lieutenants, and three full-time battalion chiefs. We're looking at adding another 12 blue shirts in June. They're going through interviews so far, and the, the list will be published this week on the final list on their preference points. And from that, we will be offering employment. Keeping them is a problem. Uh, thank God that we've been able to keep most of our full-timers. Out of the 24, one left us for another job that paid $6,000 a year more. But it's hard to compete with the big district or big apartments. Uh, other than that, uh, we have the lowest tax, third lowest tax rate of a district in, in McHenry County. Uh, and we had 7,500 calls last year, which puts us number two in the county, only behind Crystal Lake, which is now the district. That's the highlights. <laughs> one, one of the comments that I think I made, um, Kelly, I think you'll remember, um, but I have talked to each of you is, as, as the year goes on, we're going to provide an opportunity for fire chiefs as well as the board presidents to come and address us about some of the issues. We ran into a little glitch of, of some of our appointments um, last year where we heard about some issues that were going on in the fire departments that we had absolutely no information or clue about. So we're going to give them an opportunity to come and visit with us and to kind of give us that. So I appreciate it very much, Mr. Miller. I might just add, too, that the present board works very good together. Uh, we do have two new members, which Joe is one with three years, and then Kurt's got four Kurt, years. Right. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Paul. You want to join us up here, please? Our next interviewee is Paul Hildreth. Paul actually interviewed with us a few years ago and filled a vacancy uh, on the board. Yes. There are two candidates for a one vacancy position in Harvard. And so following, again, the same format, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, about your experiences, um, why it is that you're asking to be reappointed, and then some of the successes that you've experienced serving on the board and what is in the future for Harvard. Okay. I served about 27 years in law enforcement, 25 and a half years here at the Sheriff's Department, and then retired in two years in July. Um, I was on the Harvard Fire Protection District from mid-90s into the early 2000s, and then uh, kind of stepped aside, had a family and such, had other things going on. Now I'm back. I, uh, did an interview for this spot a year ago, so I've been with them for a year. Um, filled that vacancy for a year. Just trying to get, continue to help get the department back on track. There were there were some issues in the past, have been for, for a lot of years. It's not just new problems. And that we're currently without a chief. 
a permanent chief, let's call it that. We've kind of got a, what I'm going to use as an interim chief. We've got the chief or a contract with Rango Fire to fill in our chief position, which is actually, I think, doing pretty well. It's really turning the department around, um, getting some people promoted, been able to bring some people back, actually, that had kind of stepped away from the department. Um, so I don't know that we'll ever be fully staffed, I guess. So he has been able to help bring in some new people, some people that are trained, which is, you know, everybody's problem. You got quite a bit of training that leads up to putting somebody on the street. And, and then we run into a big problem not being full time that you you send people off to train, you train them, they stay with you for a little while, they leave. So it's kind of a revolving door. It'd be great if we could find a way to stop that, but right at the moment, there are not enough funds in our budget to become a full-time style department. So we're trying to do the best we can with what we got, and I think we're, we're doing a phenomenal job. Are there any questions? Mr. Seiger? Two questions. First, um, I want to say thank you. Appreciate your, your willingness to serve in this capacity. Uh, what was one thing that you were totally surprised about? I mean, you've been at this now for a year. Um, what was the thing probably was the greatest surprise to you? I don't know that there was any one surprise. I mean, I kind of knew some of the situations that were going, going into it. So I don't know that there was any real surprise. I'm just glad that we're able to start getting ourselves back in the, into the right line. And, okay. I, and I think it's gone very well. Can, what, what is that right line? It, you don't assume, I apologize, don't assume that anybody that's sitting around this table that was not here the last time you interviewed has any idea of what went on in Harvard and how that whole experience unfolded. Okay. So you and might want to give a little history. And actually, I don't even know who was here last time because I was Just myself one. and Ms. Wagner, that is it. I did mine by uh Oh, that's by right. Zoom. I apologize, you did. I, I was I'm gone sorry. last year yeah. at this time. Um, they had some chiefing issues. Chief kind of, the chief had abruptly left. The, the board was kind of in fighting and such. Um, I, my impression was that the chief that was there at the time was kind of trying to take the department in a, in a full-time big city type of mentality and therefore kind of sold and traded a bunch of our equipment away and left us with some stuff that was not very viable. So we have worked very hard to get some of those pieces replaced. As we all know, you know, money is the issue again. But we were able to find the place that had traded us several pieces of equipment a year and a half ago, roughly, trade an aerial back that we could get another tender in there, a tanker in there. And we were able to work out a deal and buy an engine, a used engine from Algonquin, which is, has worked out great for us. Had a lot of, had a, had a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, but we had several manpower issues because there was some tension, for lack of a better term. So some people that had been working for us kind of stepped away. We've been able to kind of get some of those people back into the department. Good. So you've had some struggles then? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. They, they had some issues with even full board attendance at meetings to get yes. anything addressed. Okay. So quorum was an issue for them. But it's under a little bit of a new management, new chief, and it seems to be coming together. Which, just so you all understand, one of the reasons that I wanted this communication back and forth, because it, there was no apparent con communication at all from the har Harbor Protection, ha Fire Protection District to the county. And we're obviously responsible for appointing those people to serve in that capacity. So we're going to kind of change that around a little yeah. bit going forward. Ms. Oh, Campbell. Be, you know, I just person. have a second question. Oh, I apologize. Thank no, you, no. sir. Um, the second question is, you know, you mentioned that the chief is now currently coming from Marengo to assist you all. Yes, sir. Um, and that you feel that that has really brought another perspective to it that's been positive and constructive. 
Um, so has there been any subsurface conversation about consolidation between the two departments? Actually, there has been, and I don't want to say conversation per se, it was just kind of a, something that was brought up at our last board meeting mm -hmm. as, as, as an option. Um, and that's basically it. Okay, you not know, we have not gone into anything further than that. I'm not a, I'm not a big proponent of it, um, quite frankly, just because of the size of the two departments. You know, if we can get ourselves back together, and I think we can very easily, it, I mean, it's, it's getting there now. We've got a deputy chief in there as, on a kind of a part-time basis that could potentially step up and be a chief as, as the time progresses. We're just trying to kind of get all of our ducks in a row, knowing, because the chief from Moringa was helping us do our budget, keep our budget online, get our budgets written, get some of those year-end type of things back on track for us, and then hopefully by the end of the year be able to pass that on to somebody else for us. Thank you. Ms. Campbell, to follow up on that, because that was my question, what are, the, what are the sizes of the two agencies? So your size versus Marengo, when you talk about size. Just district sizes are very oh, large. I'm not okay. even talking about personnel necessarily. Okay, the this, they area. run. Yes, you're talking about area. Area, yeah. area. Yeah. yes. Okay, got it. So eventually, merging those two would be huge. Yes. If you think about build out. <coughs> got it. Okay. I would also think that Marengo would want to make sure that they're fiscally and management wise before any consolidation conversations occur. Right. Too. I mean, so the, the conversation itself right. has really never been had. It just it was brought up as. Right. A possibility. Uh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. potential possibility. So, so I'm, oh, I'm, go ahead, please continue. continue. One, one yeah, follow up question on that mm -hmm. then. So where do, does it stand in terms of uh, re, uh, getting the chief replaced or? Because now it's right now contractual with Marengo. So Correct. At, what are the next steps in bringing in a, a chief? To fully decide if we're looking for a full-time chief or a continuing with a part-time chief. Okay. Um, some it, things like that. It, it, some of it's monetary wise. Okay. You know, we've we've talked to some different people, and they're really kind of out of our budget. Okay. Is right. is where some of the problem comes in. Plus, like I said, we're just trying to get back on moving in the right direction before we try to step away from the arrangement that we have now. And Paul, I would suggest you guys call the Fire Chiefs Association and see if there's any retired guys out there that might be interested to help just because they have nothing else to do right, right. now. Right. So we have lots of questions. I have um, Member Kunkel, Member Shorten, Member Hendricks. So we'll just kind of go around in a okay. circle. Matt, the floor is yours, please. Mine is basically a follow-up to that follow-up. So do you right now do any mutual aid with Marengo? Yes. I mean, we have mutual aid agreements with, with all of our surrounding departments. That's what I want to um, Marengo, who else? Woodstock, Hebron, Walworth, Capron, Sharon. You know, we're part of it is the Mavis, Mavis system and such. Like, we've had two fairly significant structure fires in the last, I guess it's two weeks now. And so we bring in whatever resources we can from the main alarms. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Short. Um, <clears throat> discuss some of the, the issues that you kind of walked into on the board um, with the chief and the, the tension people leaving. Uh, it sounds like some of that's been remedied or a lot of it's been remedied. I believe a lot of it's been remedied, okay. yes. Are, th are there any issues persisting that, that would impact safety either to the firefighters or the residents? No. Okay. No. Mr. Hendricks. Do you anticipate, I know you said you're not a fan, I guess it's a two-part question, you're not a fan, or at least you're leaning against consolidation. Uh, do you anticipate, one, there being further talks uh, regarding consolidation? Or is it just something that Harvard's not really looking into at the moment? I guess it's nothing that we were looking into at the moment. It was just, it was a kind of a comment that was made, but then I don't know that anybody's gone any further with it at this point. 
it's just we are we're going to probably attempt to run a referendum in the fall so that we can increase some of our funding hopefully you know um, we've got the chief from one of the North Boone units, and it's the one out of um, Poplar Grove, so I don't know which district that is specifically, is helping us um, submit a grant, one of the, the, the COVID grants, and attempt to recoup some money that way for the COVID stuff. You know, we're, so we are trying with some of the grants as well to cover some of our they're not really shortfalls because we, we've been able to make the money work that we have, but in order to continue to move forward, <coughs> need to get some more money brought in. Okay. And you mentioned staffing's not at the level right now that you want it to be. Uh, approximately, what is Harvard staff at for, for their? department I don't 80 percent I do just a ballpark figure a rough estimation probably 70 is a guess 70 you know they were running five person crews at the moment they used to run five they've had to cut back um, a lot of it is is manpower issues more than anything getting people to cover can can you explain that you said they were in five person crews and they had to cut back yes so so what did they cut back to to three. To three person groups. To three. Okay. Just, you yeah. know, being three in house <coughs> at any moment in time. That's all I have. <coughs> any other questions? Yes, yes, Ms. Wagner. So obviously there's staffing issues, and I mean, it seems like every department has staffing issues, and then you have extra staffing issues compared um, <coughs> because of what's gone on. What, <coughs> I apologize, what do you, Feel is the best way to attract the um, firefighters to come work for Harvard. A lot of it is just trying to bring in new new people. I mean, everybody wants the younger people. Our problem is is that we are not full time, so we're not paying full time wages. A lot of ours is is people that work for other departments. Some other departments allow you to work for another department. Some don't. Um, We've got a couple individuals right now who have been hired by a department, and they're not allowed to do anything for us for a year based on being hired into this other department. So it's just, we, we kind of have that revolving door, unfortunately, of people who you put, you put through school, and, and, and we know that is an issue, but you put them through school and, and then they're, they get hired onto another department. We're unfortunately not going to make their career for them. So. so, so you said you put them through school, so through training. And is there any, I don't know, it, just in general, are there any requirements if a fire department puts someone through training and through school that they have to stay with them for a certain amount of time? Internally, a department can do that, yes, or, you know, <coughs> paybacks. But some of that for us gets hard to try to get people to make those commitments and then that's a retention issue. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. Mr. Hendricks. Sorry, just one more question. Sure. Does Harvard uh, utilize volunteers or is that anything that's ever been considered? We do callbacks and stuff, but it's gotten to the point for us, a lot of our people don't even live in the district anymore. Okay. You know, back in our late 90s or, and before and the early 2000s, we all lived in town for the most part. You had businesses that would allow you to leave work to, to, to go fight fires, do your EMS thing, whatever it was. And unfortunately, that's not where we're at today. Any other questions from the committee? Again, you're welcome to stick around and hear our deliberations, but we have other interviews that we're conducting okay. before then. Um, or you can actually um, tune into the computer and watch our proceedings online if you want to do that too. Otherwise, we'll call you and let you know. All right, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is Joe here? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm hiding. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And again, let me remind you that um, it's McHenry Fire Protection District. Joe has interviewed how many times now? This will be my third. For his third um, time, he truly has expressed his interest in serving on the um, board. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Talk about who you are, why, the background challenges, and what you bring, what you think you bring to the, the overall board team as we move forward. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, again, my name is Joe Kruger. Uh, I am. Uh, currently a deputy chief with the Greater Round Lake Fire Protection District. I'll give you a uh, hopefully brief history of my fire service uh, background. I, I kind of grew up in uh, diapers around fire trucks. I, I always say uh, I came from a family that had a long-standing tradition of volunteer firefighters uh, in Fox Lake, Illinois here. Uh, my dad was a assistant fire chief there. My great uncle was the fire chief. Uh, my uncle and my grandfather were all firefighters, you know. So growing up, you know, I can remember the, the whistle going off and whatever you were doing, everything got dropped and guys were running off, you know, in the old days. And I'd get all excited. And, and uh, when I turned 18 years old, uh, I was able to get on as a uh, cadet firefighter and I never looked back. Uh, so I've, uh, I've been involved in the fire service in some way, shape, or form, be it, you know, shining wheels as a little kid or, or whatnot, virtually my entire life. Um, I, um, <clears throat> when I got out of high school, my full intent was to be a full-time firefighter somewhere and, you know, have a great career, and, and my parents thought otherwise, so. They wanted me to, to be an engineer, and uh, so they brought beat me into it. So I went to college, and I loved that career too. Um, I have great mechanical ability, so it was a natural fit for me. Uh, I spent 16 years in the private sector as a project engineer and ran factories. Um, and all the while, I was a uh, volunteer, paid on call firefighter with the uh, County Township. Uh, Fire Protection District. So uh, President Miller was was my boss. I worked for Chief Horace, uh, Trustee Meyer. You know, I'm I'm very familiar with with McHenry Township. Uh, I worked there 24 and a half years. Again, starting off as a volunteer, worked my way through the ranks. Uh, you know, became a, a lieutenant, and then uh, got hired as a full-time assistant chief there. Um, Eventually took a, uh, a job as battalion chief, which is a shift job. Uh, worked there as battalion chief for a number of years. And then in uh, 2015, I got an opportunity for promotion and went over to Round Lake. Uh, I've been in Round Lake ever since. Um, I mentioned to you I have an engineering degree. I also have a, a master's degree in um, <coughs> fire service leadership. Uh, and I am also an executive fire officer. Uh, so, uh, I'm pretty educated and pretty experienced in, in the fire service and, you know, so I'm getting towards the end of my career as a firefighter um, and, you know, I'm looking at the next chapter of my life and that's kind of what started this adventure for me is I, I want to keep serving uh, the fire service and I think, uh, you know, I love McHenry, I love the McHenry Township Fire Department, I think it's probably the finest fire department in the area, well, I'm kind of partial to Round Lake too, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I want to continue to serve. So, thank you for uh, your consideration today. Questions from the committee members? Yes, Ms. Wagner. So, um, you obviously know that they're looking at to put in a new fire um, station and, and staff it. Where do you see this going and how, how do you um, uh, project the future and keep the staff that, for not only the new one, but the current, all of the fire stations? <clears throat> yeah, great question because I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges for uh, McHenry Township going forward. And that's kind of a two-part question. Uh, the first part is, is how do I feel about the station itself? 
it's a great location, uh, great foresight on on the board and the uh, and the chief staff there to, to pick that uh, spot and secure the uh, property a number of years ago. Um, there's not a ton of call volume in that area, but it um, it's going to grow into it eventually and. It services an area that they can't get at right now, be in that southern portion of the district, and then uh, way south into Holiday Hills. You know, uh, back when when I was running there, it was you know like a 12 minute plus response to get down to Holiday Hills, and then you know there's that small section of the district, uh, you know, over by uh, Nunda there, and you know, you're talking 15 minutes to get there, and that's going to cut a lot of time with that straight shot down. Uh, uh, Charles Miller Road to get there. So I think it's a great location. I think it's um, very smart to build a fire station there. The challenge is going to be staffing it uh, both from a personnel standpoint and retention and then uh, the financial burden of it, you know. And um, that was kind of some of the stuff I listed in, uh, in my challenges, uh, you know, was What's the right deployment model for, for McHenry to, uh, to, to be able to staff that, right? Because even with that sixth station, the, the, the majority of the calls happen right around station one in, in McHenry. That's kind of the population center in the district. And so it's, it's not like they can just abandon, you know, the, the staff that they have there and move them out to another station. I really can, but I think it's going to be difficult, and I think it's going to affect their response times. So uh, it's going to be added staff, and then um, how do you fund that? And you know, uh, is it going to take uh, a referendum? I, I think McHenry right now has enough money, you know, in their coffers to to fund it short term. But I think there's going to be some long term um, revenue streams that are going to need to be looked at, whether that you know involves a referendum or whatnot. To uh, to have the funding they need to, to continue to staff all the, all six of those stations, and I think it's important that they can, you know, it's a, it's a really big fire district, 56 square miles, you know, um, and it's really tough to get everywhere you need to get in six minutes. I mean, four minutes is ideal, right, in, in the case of a cardiac call, but six minutes, I mean, it, it, without that station there, it's it's impossible in that part of the district. So. It's, it's one of the biggest challenges for sure. Anyone else? Mr. Sacker? Hey, I appreciate your uh, depth and breadth of experience. Also, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I guess ultimately what what is the, the challenge here? I mean, ultimately, aren't we all going to have to go back to the voters and say, in order to be able to sustain us at the level and the professionalism, the quality of service that we all have begun to expect that we're going to have to support that through our taxes. Isn't that a reality? That, and I'm not asking you to commit yourself to, yes, a referendum for tax <coughs> increase, but don't you think that that is ultimately where we're ha going to have to go? I don't know. Um, it is is my short answer. I, I would want to look at every other possibility before before going back to the taxpayers. Are, is the district running the most efficient model they can? You know, that, that's something I would want to, as a trustee, work with the chief staff there to um, determine. Be, you know, there, there's different ways to uh, to staff a fire department, there's different ways to, to respond with vehicles. I, I think they've done a great job of looking at that already. I think they did a paramedic chase thing for a while, and it, you know that's a really innovative idea. And that's you know the kind of things that that the district will need to uh, look at going forward. Uh, there's this whole concept of community um, paramedicine, where you know you you put somebody in a car and and you send them out to a house where somebody just came home from surgery and you know this might be an off-duty paramedic or, or whatever um, and you know you send them out there to check blood pressures change dressings things like that um, there's revenue streams you can create that way um, we partner in Round Lake with um, 
the local village isn't helping with the inspection services. We have fire in, uh, inspectors, and uh, and so we send them around to do um, you know inspections for the uh, village, and and you know we've created a rev revenue stream that way. So <clears throat> there are other ways to you know generate revenue for the district. And one of the things I listed was you know from an outsider's view, kind of now as uh, uh, Looking at it, you know, McHenry's call volume has gone up like 20 percent um, since I left there. But there's been no appreciable change in population there, and I speculate that a lot of it is uh, assisted living centers. You know, I know in Round Lake we go to our assisted living center a lot and and, and pick people up and and whatnot. And there's some revenue streams that can be um, harnessed from that. Uh, you know, we put rules into place, and I know of other uh, fire departments and districts that have done that, that said, you know, uh, you have to have s enough staff on hand that, you know, if somebody falls, you can pick them up. It, it can't be the fire department's job to pick somebody up every time somebody falls. So, you know, and, and that's not a uh, adversarial relationship. I mean, we, we, you know, we meet with, with our assisted living center and, and we, we get together with them on a regular basis. They invite us over for, you know, Chile once a year, all our, they take care of all of our guys. So we have good relations with them, but you know they know that that our business is not you know the assisted living center. Our business is to support emergencies at the assisted living center. So there, you know there's opportunities for revenue streams like that. Um, I always think about it. Uh, you know if if uh, if Amazon was running the fire department, would they do things the way we do it? In some cases. Probably not. In other cases, maybe so. But you know, companies like that, um, you know, their whole thing is is efficiency in what they do. And I, I think in the fire service, we need to be looking at it from that eye too. Appreciate your most thoughtful answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, again, you can stick around and hear the deliberations. You can go online and watch us deliberate, or we'll call you later. I wish I comments. could stay. I've got to get back to work. Understood. Understood, sir. Thank Thanks you very much. Thanks again for your consideration. I appreciate it. Yep. Um, Thank you. Next on tap, we have Joel. Is it, am I going to say it correctly? Boulette? I'll, I'll accept that. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Joel, we've been kind of following a format of tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us why you're interested in being yes. appointed to um, the Fire Protection Board, and then what you see is some of your strengths and skills that you're going to bring to that team to move their um, goals forward. So, okay. <coughs> I just turned 55 years of age this year, so I'm looking for something a little different. I, I don't want to do what I'm doing forever, so I want to retire. And uh, fire service is what I like to do, what I've done for um, 23 years. So I'm kind of want to go back to that. I kind of got away from it for a few years. I end up getting divorced uh, and I end up moving up to Harvard because it's more affordable up there. So that's where I've been for the last about 20 years now. So um, I like it up there and I was thinking about joining the fire department but I just did not have the time. So with my, my work that I do now, um, I was on uh, I, at 18 years of age, right out of high school, I, actually I was still in high school and I joined the fire department. I joined Menda Fire Department because it was one of the few fire departments that you could join when you were 18. Um, I had a little help from my grandpa who was a chief up in Racine, Wisconsin. My uncle was a captain in Racine, Wisconsin. My mom was also a firefighter up there. So um, so I always had firefighting in my blood, I wanted to join. So uh, Nunda was the first, I wasn't really in Nunda's district, I was in Crystal Lake's district, but Nunda took me out at 18. I was the, the young punk there at the time. Um, it was, we didn't have pagers, we didn't have, uh, they had a siren basically that went off. So we all came when the siren went off and everybody came out of the farm fields and answered calls. And I was, uh, I don't know how to put it, I'm, I'm that guy now. So everybody was like my age <laughs> so, and I was the young guy. So they uh, pushed me to go to school there. I went to school, I took every class they offered. I took. Uh, you name it, I took every certification there was. And uh, I got a degree in fire science, associate's degree. Um, I was possibly gonna be the next chief. There was a rumor that I was being looked into. I thought about it. 
Um, unfortunately, my life changed at that time, so I ended up getting divorced. That was a paid on call department. It was not a full-time department. So the chief they have there today was the guy that I trained um, to be, he was a, uh, a spooky training officer for him back in the day. So that's the guy who's the chief there now. Two of the trustees that are on that department I trained, so they're both there now. Um, I ended up moving to Crystal Lake, overlapped my 23 years a little bit with Crystal Lake because that was in Crystal Lake's district and the chief took me on there. They just uh, wanted more people with more skills. They had some young kid out of high school at the time. So, so I was also on Crystal Lake and Nunda at the time. Um, but about the same time I started with the fire department, I also got a job with the gas company, and that's where I've been for over 30 years now. Um, worked my way up there too from a meter reader, and now I'm in charge of the quality assurance department, basically a, on the site trainer. I cover 15 counties in northern Illinois from uh, pretty much Lake, a lot of Lake County up to about 45, if you know where that is, and all around the metro area of Chicago, and then all the way out the Mississippi River, down to Amboy, where I was yesterday. So I, I kind of get around out there. I just train people and make sure they're doing their job the right way that the ICC would want us to run our job. So it's, uh, we don't have a building department that tells us what to do. So the ICC kind of uh, tells us what to do, but I keep the ICC away. So. Um, what am I missing here? I think it's pretty good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are there any questions from committee members? Yes, Mr. Awesome. Hendricks. Um, so it was mentioned uh, with uh, Paul earlier uh, that there were at least brief discussions or at least the topic had been brought up regarding consolidation. Do you feel that's necessary? Is that something you're open to? Just your thoughts in general. For consolidation of Harvard Fire Department? Correct. To uh, Moringo. Is with Moringo. 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 I have heard that. I don't know. I don't know if that's even possible. I mean, I, I, I'd have to look into it. I don't know all the legal details. I don't know if I think that's something that everybody has to vote on kind of thing. Probably. Um, so if, if that would happen, that would happen. I, I believe years ago, Spring Grove and Richmond, I want to say, were possibly going to do that because I think they were sharing the same, same chief at the time. Um, I know it's, it's been an issue, and it's always an issue when you can't get people to come to calls. So that's where you're going to look at other departments to come for help. And I know, uh, well, Lakewood, Lakewood tried it for a while in Crystal Lake. You know, Crystal Lake is now back taking Lakewood over. It didn't, didn't work for them too well, but um, it's a it's a possibility. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's needed or not. I I have to get into the nitty gritty. I have a lot of my own opinions on things, but I, I don't have a lot of the facts. I don't know how the departments really run there. Um, I've been to a few trustees meetings. I've sat and listened. I uh, I know a few people there over the years, and I know there's a lot of issues there. So I know uh, morale is one of them, and that needs to be boosted somehow. I have a few ideas on that. Um, Mor morale at Marengo, you're saying? No, um, Marengo, Marengo's fine. It's Harvard has morale issues. They, okay. have, they have a lot of, they have some issues that need attention, and I believe it all, I believe a lot of it's coming from the trustees. So. Mr. Sack. You uh, indicate you have a fire science degree that's from MCC? Yes. I actually went to Triton College because McHenry County didn't have a lot of it at the time, so okay. I went to both. Very good. I took what I could here and I had to go there to get other classes. Very good. Thank I you. don't know if you were in the room, but if you mention Woodstock, that's an extra point for Mr. Sager. Yeah. So just to let you know that he kind of was out there at the <laughs> couple <of> <laughs> Anyone else? So Ms. Wagner. We've had a lot of conversations about staffing. Just wondering how you would, um, you can't solve the staffing, but how you would help solve the staffing issue up there. Um, when I was back on Nunda, we had, we used to come out of the farm fields basically to answer calls, and this, the people, you didn't know who was going to show up. And that's kind of how Harvard was too back in the day. And since then, I believe they put four people on to, you know, they're in the station at all times to handle calls. That was cut back to two, I believe. It might be at three now, I don't know for sure. Um, I would like to get that back up to four because it's it's a huge district. 
um, it's I believe 108 square miles. It's, it's possibly I don't know the facts, but I believe it is, if not the largest, the second largest fire district in the state of Illinois. So it's huge, and um, to have one ambulance gone with two people, and then something else happens, you need it. You need at least two ambulances with four people, two on each for calls. If you have an ALS call, which is like a heart attack, for example, you're going to need four people there just to handle that call. Um, so I would really like to see four people there. Um, I don't know budget-wise. I don't. I know they have some serious budget issues there. Um, there's. Um, again, I'm not. I haven't seen a lot of it. I have seen their, their their budget for the year. I see some things that could come and go, and uh, other things I don't understand. But I, I think common sense. I don't think like the typical person. I guess so. It's like I don't know why we're doing some things when we could do others. But but I would like to see the staffing go up to four, basically. I would like to see more POPs brought on, and I would like to see the morale. I believe if you have the morale of the POPs, I'm that 18 year old kid that joined and I, I wanted to be on there so bad, I would do anything. Well, they said, okay, you're in charge of clothing. Well, okay. And I, they gave me a job, and it, it made me feel important. And I think if everybody has that, if you have 50 people in an apartment doing 50 different tasks, and everybody's a specialist on something, I think that morale would go up a lot. And I'm not trying to be the chief of the department, but I mean, that's what uh, the, if they need coaching, that's what I would do to bring up the morale. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, you. Again, you're welcome to stay in here. Deliberations. You can watch us online, or we'll let you know. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Hey, Greg. Do you want to take a seat? Um, our next and last interviewee, I don't know if that's good for you or not, sir, um, is Greg Danielson for the Crystal Lake Rural Fire. Um, in this particular case, it's one for one. So maybe you want to take a little bit of a different approach and talk about some of the things that you, uh, you have addressed um, and the department has addressed over the past few sure. years. And again, just, uh, just for this committee, because many of the members are new, a little bit of background about who you are sure, and sure. who that association was. So Thank you. I, 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 don't even, I don't smoke cigarettes. I wouldn't know how to put out a fire. So they, I, I mean, I know nothing when I got asked to do this. I got a phone call from Bob Seegers years and years ago, 15 years ago, and he said, would you be interested in, in joining the Crystal Lake Rural Fire District Board? And I said, what's that? Because I, I live in the country. He said, well, basically, we live in a donut around Crystal Lake, and we don't have a fire department, so we have to contract service. So I said, I didn't even know that. Here I lived in my house already for 15 years or 20 years, and I didn't know that. I just figured Crystal Lake came out and took care of the fire department. You know, fire service, he said, no, we have to have a contract. So anyway, would you be interested? I said, sure. So I went to a meeting and I found it very interesting. And like I said, so Crystal Lake is a fire department and the Crystal Lake Rural Fire Protection District does nothing more than purchase fire protection and ambulance service from the Crystal Lake, from Crystal Lake. But we could hire Woodstock if we chose. We could hire Cary, we could hire McHenry. We could have our own department if we really wanted to, okay? Well, Crystal Lake does a great job, so that's always who we've contracted through. So basically what we do is we collect the monies, you know, we collect the monies, and our contract says that we keep 90.5% of it, or the city of Crystal Lake gets 90.5% of it, and the district has the rest of it that we set aside for whatever. We keep only about a six month reserve, and then anything extra we give right back to the city. So if they need, uh, let's say they need a fire truck, or let's say they need a person, a piece of equipment. We'll make sure that we will help them out on that. So it's been a great, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great relationship we have we've had with the city. Like I said, we could we could hire other places, and I have nothing against McHenry, I have nothing against Woodstock, but <laughs> since we're Crystal Lake, it makes the most sense that we would naturally use Crystal Lake. You know. So that's basically it. And um, 15 years ago, or whenever it was, I got asked to be on it. I never thought I'd be doing this. And I called the president the other day, yesterday morning, and I said, look, I only want to do this one more year. 
because uh, I just, so my appointment is only going to be for a year. I said, but I'll give them a year if we can find somebody because there's other things I want to do. Um, my wife would like me to start, I'm going to retire eventually down the road. She'd like me to do some other things. So, but I will do this year because I do really enjoy it. We only meet once a month. Sometimes if there's something going on, we have special meeting, you know, it might be twice a month. So it's not a complicated, it's not a complicated job, but I do feel that, um, I do feel that I do help out because we really watch our money. And the chief is right there with us in our meetings. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So it's like, he almost works for us at this one month of meeting, and he does because we, he's at, we're actually his boss at that time. So it's, but I think, I think we're the only district, paper district in McHenry County. There could be one that's partial towards Barrington, but I think Chris Lake Real Fire Protection is the only paper district where we don't have any. Now it yeah. is. It didn't yeah. used to be, but now it is. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and it's interesting, and I don't want to keep talking, but I, it, I sometimes think it would be nice if the district could be eliminated because it'd be one more unit of government, even though it's not a lot of money to run our district, it's still one more unit of government. This is an interesting thing. I, and I wrote this down. Our, our district, the tax rate is 0.442, okay? City of Crystal Lake is 0.72. So if the, if the city would take over, our taxes would go up quite a bit more for fire protection because that's, we yes. negotiate a rate. So I don't know how that would happen. I know if the, if the chief was here, he, he would agree with me. I think if we eliminated our district and had the city take it over just like that, our rate would be up to 7 or 0.72. I have a feeling. I, I think you're right. Yeah, because yeah. I don't think it would be fair to the citizens of Crystal Lake if they said, wait a minute, we're in Crystal Lake and our rate is 7.2, but you're over there. At, yeah. So that's what I think. So it does keep our taxes lower. So I'll ask if there's any questions. I I only had I was thinking of one when you were sitting and talking, yeah. um, and it's now completely I'm, left my head. I'm, so I'm just glad you don't have anything against Woodstock. <laughs> and I'm oh. thankful you'll give another year. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that, that was my, thank you. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah. So what are you guys doing to find somebody to take your place in, in the year? Are you actively yes. looking? Okay. I was actually hoping that, because it, it's in the paper, I was actually hoping, the, 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 as you guys know, the application process goes in the paper. And I was actually hoping that somebody would say, hey, I'd like to be on it. Nobody applied. And... Um, I don't know what the deal is with that. People don't want to do it, so. Maybe we can help you with a little bit more social media coverage yeah. of the opening yeah. of the year, maybe. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I just, I like it, but I just think um, it'll be 16 years, that's enough. You know, something different. So. Thank you. But I will give it a, a year, and I'll give it a good year, so. Not like I'm gonna drop out in a few weeks or anything, so, okay? We do. But I want to be up front. Yeah, we appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks. It's only going to be a year. So <laughs> you'll hopefully you. have somebody in the front. Any questions? Thank you very much. We okay. really appreciate right. it yep. very much. Yep. Go back you to work. Oh. <coughs> um, so the next item on our agenda is the deliberations. And I'm going to ask a little bit of latitude. Um, and I note that both Fox River Grove and, Har and um, Crystal Lake Rural only have one applicant for one vacancy. So I'm going to assume that those are the individuals. And so what I'm looking for is a motion to make a recommendation to the board for those two individuals for those vacant positions. I saw Mr. Shorten seconded by Mr. Eric Hendricks. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, that motion carries. So let's go on and deliberate according to our agenda. Um, the next one would be the McHenry Township Fire Protection District. We had um, two openings. We had four applicants. Um, we had Mr. Jordy, Mr. Myers, who are currently serving in those positions. And then we had Mr. Altoff and Mr. Kruger, um, who were requesting consideration. And I will note for all of you that truly it is true, Mr. Kruger, I, I have interviewed Mr. Kruger more than I have interviewed people that have worked for me <laughs> for that 
position. Um, so who would like to um, start the conversation or make a recommendation? And again, I, I would ask that we hold off on making a motion right. until we have an opportunity to deliberate. Right. Mr. Sager? I have a little bit of challenge because it seemed like everybody that came up here uh, to apply for McKinney Township Fire Protection District was talking about the fact that it was the best in the state or the best in the region or the best in the county and it is. Woodstock's got a tremendous <laughs> fire rescue <laughs> district, uh, you know, and we've got a, this huge showing of uh, McHenry, and the only thing I'm missing are flags waving out there. So I, I uh, For, yeah. former Woodstock mayor to former McHenry mayor, yeah. we uh, by far yeah. are the largest and the best. Just saying. We're, we're going to have to have a bet about that, too, but that's okay. Uh, maybe some friendly competition down the road on that. But anyway, I, I do appreciate the fact that there, uh, I believe, are some incredibly strong individuals here who have expressed interest in service on this uh, important district uh, board of trustees. So I want to thank everybody who has expressed their, their commitment to service in this regard. So thank you very, very much. Um, I guess one of the things that I um, look at as I try to consider this is three things. The first thing is I think it's really important that there is some degree of, of uh, passion there and I was pleased with the degree of passion that's been exhibited and that seems to be it's kind of interesting because that seems to be pretty typical in the fire district area itself the fire fighters the fire rescue people there's just this family passion I mean it's almost passed on from one generation to the next generation and I appreciate that uh, that passion and so uh, that was pretty evident in, in all of the uh, individuals the second thing I'm really interested in is frankly the the professional expertise where individuals are coming from and what they bring in terms of that professionalism and that knowledge uh, to the position and the the third thing that I am really interested in is the fit um, and fit is somewhat uh, of an intangible many many times as you're trying to make decisions about uh, um, hiring people or trying to have people uh, serving on a, a board or a commission is what is that fit and how are these individuals going to uh, contribute something that is unique if you will to the position itself and so that's uh, one thing that I, I think is really kind of a standout in this regard uh, for me and so I, I don't know if we're in a position I don't know if it would be appropriate, Madam Chair, but I, I would guess I would be interested in a little bit of a conversation between the current uh, chief and the, the president. I, is that something that we would entertain, or do you prefer that not to happen? The, I, they, I believe they are here in the event that there are any questions that the committee members may have. Um, I certainly would invite them up to the table if anybody has any specific questions. Um, I, I too thought that this was um, a, a unique situation. Again, wonderful that we have so many applicants for those positions. Um, but again, great, it, you know, difficult decisions to make because they all have a connection. I, I'm going to kind of sit back, honestly, and, and remove myself from that and allow you. I, I know all of these applicants extraordinarily well. I obviously have um, a phenomenal relationship with the Township Protection District in McHenry. So I, I'd rather have you guys have that conversation without any undue influence from myself. So um, Mr. Miller and Chief, can you kind of come <coughs> up and, and take a seat up here? And if there is any further um, questions or information that the committee members are seeking, you would at least be available to, to do that. Mr. Sager, do you have specific yeah, questions? I, yes, Please. thank you for your willingness, mm -hmm. uh, Chairman, uh, for allowing this opportunity to discuss things a little bit, I guess. Um, one of the things that I want to clarify, the two incumbents, right, the two individuals are Mr. Doherty, is that correct? Yes. And then uh, Mr. Mike. Yes. Is that correct? Those That's are correct. the two people that are presently on the board. On the board. And I believe that there was a comment 
before from you um, that you know you were pleased with the current board. Um, you feel like people have served well and uh, continue to serve well. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And if you look at the board itself um, and, and the membership of the board, and Chief, I'll address this to you, um, as a, a professional, and you are working with here a, 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 trust, a group of trustees, do you believe that you've got the, the pillars covered? Is there a pillar or a need, a, a value, or something out there that isn't covered? whether that has to do with personnel, uh, knowledge, experience, management, whether that has to do with um, a knowledge about financing, whether that has to do with the knowledge of, of training efforts uh, and that type of thing. Is there any pillar out there that's currently missing? And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna caution you. Do me a favor, factual information, you know, again, it was a right. it was a direct question, and and let's not try and and let you know kind of an opinion or a guidance from the two of you. So answer the questions sure. factually. I, I think you can do that, but I'm just going to caution you a little. I think the you know the best and most appropriate way for me to answer that question, and I've been um, you know a little bit of my background. I've been in the fire service for 40 years. Uh, previously to coming to McHenry, I worked for one of the largest cities in the states, where, the state where I was uh, responsible to a city council. Uh, now I'm responsible to a board of trustees. And at, at the risk of sounding like I'm not answering your question, as, as the fire chief, my responsibility is whoever is selected as the five representatives of the public to, to serve on that board. My job is to work very hard to make sure that uh, the department and our staff and myself as a chief have a very good working relationship with the board. Uh, my, my job is to support the board um, and, and to work in conjunction. They, they set the, the, the guidance and the direction of the district. My responsibility as well as the other members of the staff is then to carry that out. So it, 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 and I'll apologize, it may sound like well, you're not answering the question, but Again, as, as the fire chief, whoever the five trustees are, um, it's my responsibility to work with, with those five individuals. Um, I will say, I, I believe our, our, our board, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking back at my experience over the years of working with different boards or being responsible to a city council, um, our board is extremely supportive of the fire district. Um, they take a very, uh, they take their responsibility as far as being the fiscal stu uh, stewards of the taxpayers' money uh, very seriously. And um, as I think President Miller may have identified in his letter, we have a, there, there is a very strong and good working relationship from my perspective between the, between the board uh, as well as with the staff of the department. And, and, and so again, ultimately, and I, and I hope you can understand, you know, the perspective that is the most appropriate one for me to, to, to convey to you. Um, whoever the, the five members of the board are, I'm going to work very hard. Uh, I'm going to very, work very hard for those people. Hey, and I appreciate that very much. I had dinner last night with uh, the city manager of Woodstock, and we were talking about the coming elections, and of course, uh, city manager said exactly the same thing. I'm sure that Peter feels exactly the same way. You know, your responsibility is to work for those who are, are elected or appointed, and so I'm grateful for that. President Miller, any voids that you think exist out there that could be filled by a given individual? Not asking for names, I'm just asking generally, are there voids of knowledge or background or experience? Not right at this point, no, I don't think our board has any Boys. Very good. Thank you so much. Yes, Ms. Campbell. I was just going to say, um, I just to point out something that I have seen, um, just because my liaison to EMA, uh, you are also the only fire uh, protection district that's currently participating in our natural hazard mitigation plan. So obviously you do take that role very seriously. Um, we, we, I apologize. Go ahead and finish your... No, no. And so I think that that's wonderful. I'd like to see more of the districts do that. So I just want to point that out. 
We do, uh, you know, and it's interesting, it was, it was mentioned, we, we do have a strong relationship with the county. Uh, we have participated for several years. I know Mr. Christensen is here and, and we have participated in the natural hazard uh, mitigation. Uh, actually, uh, when I was going through the executive fire officer program uh, for a chief officer, and one of my papers was um, on addressing natural hazards and uh, within the McHenry Township Fire Protection District. A lot of the work that was done by the county and by Mr. Christensen was, was uh, very helpful. Um, we partner with the county in other areas. Um, the Sheriff's Office recently began a uh, social worker program and when, with hiring social workers, uh, which uh, it was mentioned, you know, that, that is a, uh, for most fire departments, including ours, that is one of your top call categories. Uh, as soon as we found out about that and that um, the Sheriff's Office was looking for locations for those individuals who have office space, um, our board said, let's, let's get on board with that. So the social worker hired by the Sheriff's Office who covers some of the nine communities that we protect uh, she has her office space at our fire station number five, which is, we, we believe helps the uh, county out quite a bit, the sheriff's office, and it provides a lot of benefits. I believe we're the only fire department that so far has, has done that. And, and the last thing I'll, I'll take the advantage of mentioning is uh, we were the recipient um, last year of a $361,000 grant of the advanced McHenry County funding which uh, it was mentioned previously that we have some additional ambulances on order. Uh, one of those ambulances and the equipment for it is being paid for by that grant. So um, going back to your original point, yes, we, I, I think we've sought out those opportunities to partner, whether it's with the county or, or with the other uh, surrounding fire departments. <coughs> Mr. Kunkel. Um, addressing the committee, not you two gentlemen, no, think, but um, I've never been a proponent of if it's not broke, don't fix it. In fact, my whole career has been about project perfection and preventative maintenance. So I'm always looking to tweak those things. Um, I like the fact that we have checks and balances in government. I like the fact that new blood comes in and stirs the pot. Um, but when you have a district that is really, really working and working cohesively, that to me should not be disturbed. The only caveat I had to that is we listen to every one of these districts say the same thing. They are not able to retain people. That's the underlying problem. Is it imperative that this group looks at the fact that is there a candidate amongst these candidates who could serve that little feature better than what's happened? The status quo is not working. We're not holding people. So is there a candidate? One of the candidates made mention about doing more PR, doing a little like we do now in McHenry County and advancing the county through that. And all of us have seen this county advancing through those things. Several of us have done the brew thing twice. So it's, um, it's made the imperative that we look at that with an open lens also, again. There specifically is working, but is there a bit of perfection? Is there a bit of preventative maintenance we can add to that? Anyone else? Ms. Wagner? I'm just, I just had it up and I can't find it. The, the people who are on currently, are there any firefighters on the board currently? We have one full-time firefighter on the board. Yes. And we have an ex-chief on the board. And then the rest of us are business people. But the ex-chief is also a business person. Okay. Yeah, that's just, I don't know how imperative that is to have firefighters versus business people because everybody has different expertise. This is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cronkin. Again. Ms. Wagner's point, this is very difficult because truly very, very qualified individuals. No, no, no 
questioning that whatsoever. Uh, again, like I said, I only threw out if there's a need to add to that quorum to make that better fulfillment for me. I, and I, I want to throw out to all of you, too, something to, to bear in mind is we have had this committee prior to the elections had some significant conversation about, again, encouraging people who do not, who are not successful in being appointed to come back and to take that into consideration as we move forward. Again, I, I leave that for you to consider, but I certainly am a big proponent. We have a lot of people who I want to encourage to remain involved and not just think this was, you know, we heard you, we rejected you, never come back again. So one of the comments that we did talk about is when we send letters out is to encourage them that when, again, there's a vacancy that they reapply and come back and we certainly will take that, which is why I made mention that, you know, this was not Mr. Kruger's first time in front of us. Mr. Sutton. I know that we had an opportunity to ask some questions of the individuals who uh, applied previously, but if you are all right with it, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to ask Mr. Meyer a question. You know, I, I, I know I, I feel uncomfortable that everybody else isn't here and the interview is over, so I'm really kind of uncomfortable with that if that's acceptable. That would, that would be my preference is not to open it up just, again, because the convenience of him being here is there. So, Thank you. sorry. Ms. Campbell. Um, well, to um, then Mr. Hendricks. Member Kunkel's um, point, I mean, I think I think our districts do struggle with retention, but I do think that there are, I mean, the county struggles with reten retention, right? It's just, an, it's, it's kind of an ongoing issue for a lot of agencies, and sure, the bigger agencies are going to attract people. Um, I know a young man who is very much interested in the county township and is working his way that way, and, and so this particular district is seen as kind of a, a good place to go. Um, for somebody trying to get to start their career in um, fire uh, safety. So, um, it, so unfortunately, that's kind of the gate, the, the life that we lead right now. That l these bigger agencies are going to outcompete us, but there are other issues that we can bring forward. And that's quality of life, you know, living closer to where you work, you know, what you have to do in this particular job. But um, just there are other things that can be part of the overall package that makes working here. Um, attractive, so I guess, um, yeah, it is an ongoing challenge, right? So, um, not sure that that. But again, sense. hopefully, closer collaboration between all of us, the county board members, as well as our township protection districts, and maybe we can find some creative ways to be collaborative together, as we've experienced in other avenues. So, I am looking forward to those kinds of conversations as well. Mr. Sager. Oh, no, Mr. Hendricks, did you well, have something to say, sir? I, I was just going to ask Mr. Sager what his question mm -hmm. was. I, I was just okay. interested in sure. if, Or if you could phrase it in a way that's not directed to Mr. Meyer. What was your concern? Uh, it's not really a uh, concern. It uh, was a follow-up, really, to the chair's point uh, about individuals uh, who have shown an interest with enthusiasm uh, and to try to retain that enthusiasm um, in the next round, I guess. So that's what it was centered on. So, and I'll let you interpret that. <laughs> My, I, if the committee is okay with it, I would like to make a motion. Is there further discussion before we hear a motion? Mr. Sager. I move that uh, this committee recommend to the board that we um, appoint the two incumbents to continue their public service with gratitude. Is there a second to that motion? Mr. Hendricks. Any further discussion? Kathy, might, might I ask you to call the roll, please, and leave me for last? So this will be for Joseph Doherty and Robert Meyer. Yes, ma'am. Sager. Yes. Wagner. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Conkle. Yes. Shorten. Yes. Alcock. Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and the next deliberation is for Harvard. There is one vacancy. We have two applicants. We have a returning member, um, Mr. Hildreth, <coughs> and then we also have a new applicant, Mr. He let me kind of butcher his last name, I think, but Mr. Brulet. So discussion. Ms. Wagner, did you have a comment? I do. Um, <laughs> so really. I'm reading your body language so well this morning. <laughs> I know. This is, again, a very difficult thing. It is. You both have a lot of experience and have best intentions. Oh, okay. um, the only thing that I think is important is that Mr. Hildreth has that um, experience. He's been on there for one year. And I just think because everything's changing and hopefully for the better that there's just a continuation of, of leadership with the board. Um, but that that said, that doesn't mean that Mr. Millet would would be a poor candidate either. I, Again, we have uh, this, when I first joined the board um, five years ago, we were begging for people. It has shifted as more people come forward and are interested in serving their communities. It is a delight, and I know all of you are pleased too, to see that engagement. Um, so these kinds of conversations, although difficult, really are, are a very positive um, reflection on the county. <coughs> Mr. Sager. Uh, I concur. I think that um, at this time of change for Harvard, that a degree of stability is really important. I, I take nothing away from uh, Mr. Bolay because I think that he has a lot to offer, uh, and I'm hoping that he will continue to to um, to be available because I think there's going to be some continued changes, and so I would appreciate that very, very much. Um, I. This is a little bit similar to something that we just recently went through, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm one of those that I truly believe, uh, and I don't want to go into things retroactively, but you know, we've had somebody that's been there for a year, commended themselves for years, continue to uh, express interest and share their gifts and talents, and I think we need to continue to provide them that opportunity to grow. Mr. Short? I, I was just going to concur with all these we have you know, experienced candidates, uh, different levels of knowledge, but again, with Mr. Hildreth just being appointed within the past year, um, and especially the challenges that it sounds like Harvard has gone through, that consistency will be valuable. Mr. Coco. This is the point where you think I'm going to stir the pot, but actually, <laughs> <laughs> the situation is completely, <laughs> to my mind, different because of the fact that Harvard is in crisis and has been being stabilized, I believe Mr. Hildreth should be given time to finish this job that he started. Whereas our last one, they really were a non-entity. They Luckily, we haven't had used them at all for anything, so it was kind of opened up there. And, I, and I will note that Mr. Hildreth did step forward when the kind of there was a unstableness there. He stepped forward and volunteered he his time. Into the fray. He yeah. did, yeah. he did. So, um, you know, historical comment. Yes, I'd like to make a motion then. Oh, to can I just take a comment? Oh, well, sure, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Because I would really like to, um, I agree, I understand what everybody's saying, so I agree. And I'm not going to put your name, so I'm just going to ask that I would really like, I think Joel brought a lot to the table and really hope that he comes forward next time. And understanding that it was the first time applying not to take that the wrong way and really hope that you come back because I think you would do a good job. Yes, I, I concur. So going back, Mr. Conkle, please. For Mr. Hildreth for the position. Is there a second, Mr. Hendricks? Kathy, can you call the roll, please? Wagner. Yes. Conkle. Yes. Sager. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Hendricks. Yes. Shorten. Yes. Altov. Yes. Motion carries. Excellent. All of those candidates will move forward to the full county board for consideration and action. So, moving on to old business. Um, we have no new liquor license, correct, Kathy? That's correct. All right, so routine, routine consent agenda. Does anybody have any questions or would like to remove anything from that? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve? Ms. Wagner, seconded by Ms. Campbell, and a roll call. Or do you want me to do that? Okay, thank you. <coughs> 
I, I know it takes you a little while to get all of this down. I apologize. No worries. Jordan? Yes. Kumpel? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Hendricks? Yes. Wagner? Yes. Sager? Yes. Altoff? Yes. Motion carries. Um, presentations. We have three presentations this morning. Um, I'm going to look at all of you and smile, my nice little smile, and ask you to keep them as concise about providing us all the information that we possibly may need because we also do have some reports that we have yet, and it's already 1030 this morning. So our first uh, presentation is from our court administrator, um, Seth. Oh, you're, you're Michael, you want to so come? Sure, come on, come on. Hi, I'm Mike Camille. I think I've heard Camille, before. Sorry. I'll take two minutes, <laughs> and then I'm going to give my other eight to Dan. <laughs> we do a lot across the wear. So first, I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity. I know I know pretty well many of you. I think I administered oats. How close yes, that? Yes, you did. <laughs> Unlike Seth, who brought a posse, Danger <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> Bay. <laughs> we have the way we're set up is I'm the chief judge somehow. Um, then I have four presiding judges who who oversee the who oversee Do I get credit for this thing? Yes, you do. <laughs> No, but we have four presiding judges who oversee our divisions. And Judge Gervais, Dave Gervais, some of us have known him way too long. Um, but he's handling our civil division. So he, he handles everything going on civil. Our other judges, they're working. We have one in the Middle East um, working with the IJ on a trip. But we wanted to come and show appreciation, answer any questions, tell you a little bit about what we do. In the 90 seconds or so that I have left, um, while Dan gets set up, you know, one thing I wrote a couple of notes so I don't forget is we work hard across the street. You don't see it, and we don't like to talk about that, but we're constantly in, in offices. Eric comes to visit, and well, he, I'm not going to say he causes the same problems. No, you know, and that's what we do. We solve problems. We, we're blessed to have that opportunity. Um, you know, people come there for weddings and adoptions, which are really cool but generally people don't want to come across the street. So we take that seriously. Um, we're admonished, we admonish ourselves, we're taught, taught by others in the state judiciary, you know, watch your P's and Q's, and we do, we try. And they, that's, that's a challenge, right, Pam? Because we come to you all for funding, and that's the way the state put this thing together. And we also go to Sheriff Tatelman for security. Um, but often the sheriff is in front of us every day um, you all with ordinance violations, so we, we, we try to do what we can, and we're very conscientious of those issues. If I, before I turn over to Dan, um, I'm going to give you our top three issues, if I could. Please. Not issues or, or topics. Concerns or topics. We're blessed to be able to get back our 19th judge. We've been working on it with 18, a little short staff by operation of a statute. We worked hard through some legislative maneuvering statewide or five circuits like this. By the way, 25 circuits, we're one of the 25. We're getting that a judge back, hopefully by July 1st, that we're talking scheduling-wise. Remote proceedings, that, that's a big topic um, necessitating us to come to you all, and, and we're so appreciative. Talk about filling spots. It's tough, to, it's tough to get people to come to a great place to work. But the remote proceedings, the Supreme Court justifiably have said, you know, hybrid, and, and we're doing it all. So that, that's a big topic we're working on. By the end of this week, we have to roll out a, a rule that's going to tell, the, that has to be approved by the Supremes, that's going to tell the world how we interact. But we're going to keep where you can if you're working. We appreciate that. You don't have to take a day off to come for whatever it is at the courthouse. <coughs> and then, you know, the other thing that I'm going to leave you with Judge is. Honorable, can, can I ask a favor? That's, yeah. that's a big topic, I think, across many avenues and, and venues. Can you keep us apprised on, oh, yeah. on how that is working, just so we all get <laughs> that, that feedback? That's that's important to all of us, too, that, on, the, on the checklist. We give each other work. <laughs> He's looking for to, don't get scared, are we off the record? We're looking for the, we're looking for the next Zoom. We've been using remote court proceedings since 2014. Right. But yeah, it's big, Pam, and we, we will. Absolutely, okay, we'll do that. But you know, the, the other thing that we're doing, and I, and I know Dave supports me on this, and I think our whole crew of 18, we're trying to be a responsible party statewide. I think we're really lucky, Brian. I, I, I do. Being in Woodstock, 
Um, <laughs> maybe sometimes in Crystal Lake or McHenry. No, we, and we're trying to be a responsible party. We're human beings. When I go to talk to schools, and I do, uh, Jill brought a copy of the outline that we use for our Speakers Bureau. We try to educate to tell people what we do. Um, but we're human beings. I don't walk in with my robe. I will put the robe on to show how we, we operate. And like I said, we deal with people's issues. We're human. We make mistakes. We've already been talking to law enforcement, you know, about some of our interactions because we're 24-7. Yeah. So if anybody has an issue, you know, we want to address it. And what I'll leave you with before I, I'll hand the baton to Dan, you know, because of that ethical thing or whatever, Dan, Dan has been a great hire. This is where I asked Dan to close his ears. 13 years ago when we recruited him from the great state of Ohio, mm -hmm. it's like, who's this guy? And he, he blew the doors off, and he, he's done really well for us. Unfortunately, uh, he does really well statewide, but if you ever, in meaning that he, he, he serves on a lot of Supreme Court committees and task force. But if you ever have an issue, that's probably the conduit. Um, but by all means, whether it's Dave Gervais or Mike Feeder, who heads our problem solving court division, which is a new division, um, Tiffany Davis, who handles our criminal court, she's a presiding judge of that, and then Justin Hansen, our family law division presiding judge. But, but let us know. We, we always want to get better. And uh, with that, let me give it the figurative baton to Dan. And, and I'm gonna, again, I'm going to beg a favor. A huge amount of interest. Um, if we need to do a follow-up and actually have an opportunity to visit and, and maybe get introduced to some of the judges in a much more personal fashion, we can do that. But again, I'm just going to point out it's, you know, al almost almost 11. So just keep that, bear that in mind. And I promise all of you, if there really is significant interest, we'll schedule something to spend some time and be able to go and visit and, and do a little bit more um, in-depth dive, if, if that's okay. I will handle this like our budget hearing from last year. I love you. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. All right. Here we go. Um, first of all, thank you. I love coming to these meetings and having a conversation to talk to the county board members. I love talking about the court. So a little bit about me. I've got a bachelor's in business administration. I'm a nationally certified uh, Court executive through the National Center for State Courts. Came here actually 15 years ago, Judge. Who's 13? No, okay. I'm up to 15 now. I'm up to 15 now. Um, I did, during uh, COVID, uh, I decided to pick up my master's degree in justice management. I've got 24 years of total experience in courts and different roles and responsibilities. Uh, also, during that same 24 years, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, eight years in law enforcement, prior to that, two years in juvenile uh, corrections. Specialized in uh, trial court performance measures and uh, standards of case for management. I actually did a thesis on that and how local legal culture impacts how the work gets done. So if you ever want to talk about court stuff, I'm your guy, okay? Um, also during this time, I was also uh, kind of going back to what you all were uh, interviewing for prior, did 10 years in fire and EMS. So I actually oversaw a countywide EMS service too. Uh, Joe Gieske, Joe, real quick. Uh, real quick, my name is Jill Gieske. I'm the Deputy Court Administrator. I've been in that position for two years now. Currently, or before that, I was in the Circuit Clerk's Office for 15 years. So it seemed like a really good fit when that position opened up. I'm very glad that they took me and I got to go across the hall. Uh, I have a, a Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, actually. And um, I'm working on my certification in court management from the National Center for State Courts. I have one more class to go. There are six of them. I have one to go. And I'm born and raised in Ringo, and I still have feel like I have a lot of connections to the county. I'm, I'm related to a lot of Marengo. My mom's from the big family over there. So, but glad to be where I'm at in court administration. But you love Woodstock too. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 Those who need to know, we know we're there. <laughs> there you go. Okay, uh, Judge Camille touched on some of this, so I'm not going to rehash it. Um, separation of powers, we are the judicial branch government in McHenry County. Um, we work together with the, our other branches of government. Um, skip that. Um, so, what do we do? Everything. We're, quote, general limited jurisdiction court. We handle everything you can possibly imagine from a barking dog complaint to murder and everything in between. 19 judges, as Judge Camille uh, mentioned. Court administration is actually made up of several different departments uh, under the umbrella, jury commission, law library, self-help center, special projects, and also the Department of Court Services that you're going to hear from in just a second. 
So, um, being the judicial branch of government, um, we are not a department of McHenry County, okay? By um, actually a lawsuit that was filed back in the 80s, the Supreme Court determined that court employees are just that, court employees. Even though that my salary is funded by appropriations that are given to the court, again, as Judge Camille mentioned. So, um, yeah, we're an independent branch, but we're also interdependent. Um, we have a relationship uh, that we absolutely enjoy with the county board, county administration, the other offices and other uh, uh, elected officials. That's something that we've cultivated over the years. It's something I'm very proud of. Uh, I can pick up the phone, I can call Pete, I can call Scott at the drop of a hat. They know when I'm calling that it's important. It's not just some random issue. It's something that requires some interaction about. So that's a great uh, uh, relationship that we, that we absolutely enjoy. And it makes sense for us to work together, not against each other. Um, so, quick question. What do you think the key, most important key is that I have in my computer sheet right here? This one. What do you think that door opens? <laughs> that is a. That's, that's why I like working with you. Okay. That's one. See, I went right to the vault. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. obviously different, different priorities. Nope. nope, this is more important than my house. Okay. I'd matter if I don't lock my house, but that's okay. Uh, side story. Um, this is Kathy Key's office. This is our circuit court. So I can go down to her office, put this key in the lock, open the door up, and go in. You, that relationship does not exist with the license. I can guarantee if you go to other jurisdictions, that does not happen. That's true. Because not all uh, courts and clerks' offices get along. We get along exceptionally well. So, and again, this is something that we work towards, that we strive to maintain, and we'll do our very best to uh, continue that. Um, public trust and confidence. This is, the, this is my mantra since the day I walked in the door. Okay? And this actually comes from a mentor of mine. We were actually teaching for the National Center in Holland, Michigan, and we were talking about this very thing. That you know, all of these different ways that we look at how courts are efficient and effective um, is more of a mathematical equation. So people want to get in and get their business done. So I like to think of myself as an access to justice champion. If there are barriers for people getting into the courthouse, let's tear them down. Remote court appearances, absolutely. For what? How about everything? Why? Because, you know, on my cell phone, I can do everything from get a cruise line ticket to an airline ticket to pay my taxes. And why can't I take care of a speeding ticket? Because that's what the public wants. That's what, so again, let's tear those bar barriers down. People want to get their work done or get their business taken care of quickly. They want to know there's some quality, fairness, integrity in, in uh, the entire process. I refer to this as quality customer service handling. Yes, we actually have customer service standards for court employees that I go over every couple of years. So, uh, independence and accountability, and hopefully we'll obtain public trust and confidence. But here's the thing. Public trust and confidence in the judicial branch changes. Why? Societal norms change. That's why courts, especially with COVID over, over the last few years, have had to change what the mission is and how we obtain that mission, so, or, or attain that mission. So, uh, that's something that courts need to do, quite honestly, a better job across the country, being able to pivot uh, quickly. Uh, some of our highlights, jury commission, right now we're working on a project to overhaul how we actually pay our jurors. We're going to move to a more of an electronic means. Uh, our early resolution program for divorce and parents that's now actually been uh, around now for a couple of years. We identify people very early in the process because guess what? Like Judge Camille said, most people who come to the courthouse don't want to be there, especially if they're getting divorced. Okay? The longer it draws out, the worse it's going to be. People want to get on with business, who wants to get on with life. So what we do is we look at every single case filing every month. Susie Huffman, our uh, coordinator for this project, looks at every filing, looks and sees whether or not it's a complex case. If it's not, invites them to this program. They come to the courthouse one time and leave divorced. Wildly successful program 99% of the time if we get both people in there. We've had one couple that I know of that did not get divorced. People leave, they're happy, they're content, they move on. Um, approach the bench. This is something that directly came out of COVID. This is an electronic software program written for judges. Uh, David Kislowski from the clerk's office and I had a conversation back during COVID, how can we move documents around electronically within the system so that we don't have to worry about paper. Again, COVID 
wanting not to transmit germs and all those things, this thing has grown into something that is quite honestly amazing. Most of the judges are using this software. It allows them to look at everything about the case, the case financials, sentences, documents, create documents, sign documents. They can look at their court call. It's got an Alexander calendar on it. You name it, this thing does it. The beautiful thing is, it was all done internal, and there was no external vendors associated with this at all. It was all done uh, in partnership with our judicial uh, stakeholders. We've expanded it to court services. We've also expanded it to the state's attorney and public defender's office as part of the Safety Act. And if that ever comes back again, we're ready to move forward with it. So that, that's, a, that's a huge thing. And quite honestly, if you ever want to see it, please, 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 I'd love to show it. Okay? Um, E-record, e-file, e-citation, again, the work that we're doing with Kathy over the years has been phenomenal. We are a leader not only in the state but in the country when it comes to electronics and technology and how we use that within the judicial branch. And lastly, our mentor drug court program. Uh, if you ever get an opportunity, I, I have been involved in specialty courts, drug courts, mental health courts since 1999. That makes me the oldest tenured person in this state involvement in special programs. When I started with special programs like this, I thought they were absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. I, I thought they were just, are you got to be kidding me? It's 1999, you want me to do what with these people? You, know, you want me to connect on a personal level? You, this is crazy. Went to my first graduation and I cried. I go to these graduations still, the work that these people do, the people that are you know, our clinicians, phenomenal. They save lives, I have no doubt. They change, they, uh, they help change people's uh, attitudes and motivate them to do things, you know, be citizens like us, you know, all good law-abiding, tax-paying citizens, right? That's what we want. If you get the opportunity to come, please come to one of our uh, programs. If you need to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me in any number of ways. If you call my extension, and I'm in my office, I'll pick up the phone. If you call my extension, and I'm not in the office, it will ring my cell phone, and I will answer this cell phone, wherever and whenever. Send me an email. I love working and uh, collaborating with the county board and county administration. I know I've worked with uh, Ms. Wagner, Wagner on one pro project. Hopefully we'll do that again. I love that. Uh, she brought some students in, and we did a tour. So anytime we can do that, that's all good stuff. Come talk to me, please, please. Come over, we'll sit down, we'll show you the courthouse, we'll introduce you to all the judges, anybody we can, just so that we can keep this relationship going. So that, I'm done, questions. I think we'll do that. I, I have one with, with your indulgence. We had a significantly long conversation at one of our last board meetings about the importance of providing transportation to individuals to attend our specialty courts. You're on the flip side of that. Are you seeing, is that program working effectively to actually get some of our individuals into the court system so that those things are handled appropriately? No, oh, so now you're talking about transportation to actual right. the courthouse. Right. That is, it is working. We still have some challenges when it comes to treatment. And I've been talking with uh, Kelly Schumacher, the director, about how we can possibly overcome some of those things. Um, Transportation is going to be an issue. It, Always is. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're work, you're working with a very high at risk population who don't they don't have reliable transportation, probably don't have a driver's license. You know, so the last thing we want them to do is be driving to the courthouse without a driver's license. But it does happen. So we continue to explore any opportunities to make that better. I I appreciate that answer. Thank okay, you very so much. Any anyone else have any questions? No, I would just say I would just say the specialty court going to see it because it's not just um, I mean it's the testimonials right as mm -hmm. to what they had to go through personally to get where they are and that that kind of um, I think drives the point about why it is so uh, significant to try to get these individuals there to get them the treatment mm -hmm. that they need and uh, they're very different stories but very powerful absolutely my, my first one uh, my first participant she was uh, belonged to an outlaw motorcycle probably know what that means and she fractured you know all relationships and to watch the transformation and how it's just it's, it is it's so moving it's, it's incredible Mr. I just want to say thank you to you and your entire team because I think that uh, McKinney County has become truly a, a major example of professionalism but also 
uh, being on the cutting edge of so many different types of things. And so I'm incredibly grateful on behalf of uh, the community of Woodstock, but certainly uh, all of our residents, because I think that you have really uh, taken us into the, the next century. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thanks, sir. Certainly do appreciate it. And quite honestly, for, again, the good work that's being done, that's the people that are there supporting all of us. Uh, it's a co complete team effort, and I like being out in front, so appreciate it. And I'm glad that they're all here that they can hear how much they are appreciated for the work that they do. Yes. It is acknowledged. You may not hear us, but it is acknowledged. So. Nothing else? I'll give Nothing Seth. Nothing else. Seth, come on up. Hey, by the way, <coughs> Pam, Cinco de Mayo, for those who celebrate yes. May 5th, is our law day. <coughs> We're having a ceremony on Quorum 204, and I know Liz Rochford, our new Supreme Court Justice, is coming. She's speaking. Great. But you're all invited. We'll, we'll get invitations on. I'm a little bit behind Peter. But, that alone. Um, <coughs> but please, working. yeah, please come join us if you're able. Thank you for the opportunity. <coughs> I appreciate seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seth, you're up. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. My name is Seth Grass. I'm the director of McHenry County Probation and Court Services. I have been with the agency for 22 years now, and I've worked um, with juveniles and adults, uh, predisposition and post disposition. A um, little bit about me I am a longtime, lifelong Woodstock resident. Some of you may know my mom, Sue Krause. Um, some of you may also know my grandfather, Mark Krause, who was um, a principal at Chris Lake Central and uh, also helped to build Chris Lake South. So, deep roots in this community. Uh, I feel blessed to be in a position that I'm in and to have the amazing people that I do uh, to help make this community a better place. Uh, I, did, I do have my whole management team with me today. This is just a small segment of my entire staff. I have uh, Deputy Directors Susan Payton and Megan Yacht, uh, Supervisors Lori Trout, Steve Wisniewski, Nick Hayes, Ryan Markowski, and Autumn Bun Wazer at the end, our probation analyst, Bethany Arnold. Um, this team um, is amazing, and they do amazing work to support their staff and to um, really help the staff to do great work with clients. So um, I'm here today to talk to you about probation. Um, so what is probation? The first page of Google images would tell us that probation looks like this. Um, I should have these all pop up, but nonetheless, it makes the point. That's what page one of Google would tell you is probation these days, right? There's kind of a theme there, if you'll notice, uh, a little bit law enforcement -y, right? A little real serious and stern. Um, and I want to try something with you guys that I've not done before, but uh, helps you to maybe take on a different perspective or view on how this approach to probation might not be so effective with our clients. So. Um, can anyone read that for me? Anyone? Anyone in the crowd? Can you read? No. Yeah. Can Does you anyone read? speak French fluently? No. Is what it says. No. All right. Well, then we're all in trouble. Um, I've asked the security here to bar the doors. Um, any water or food that you brought in is yours to keep to yourself or share. Um, there are no bathrooms in this room, so um, hopefully you all went beforehand. And we're going to have the internet turned off in this room uh, while, the, while the doors are closed. Your key to exit from this room, your condition that you must comply with, is to be able to speak French fluently. Okay? I'll be back in three hours. I, uh, my team and I have permission to leave, but the rest of you all have to stay. Um, I'll be back in three hours to give a proficiency test. If you can speak French fluently by that point without use of internet or anybody in here who can speak French, you're out, you're free. If not, though, we're going to graduate that sentence or that sanction and make it six hours. Uh, I'll come back at six hours after that and give you another competency test. If you can pass it, you're free to go. If not, I'm probably going to hold you here overnight. Come back tomorrow and we'll start again. This is the experience that a lot of our clients have coming through the system. They've done something wrong. They've pled guilty or they've uh, been found guilty. They are sentenced to a term of probation with conditions that sometimes they have no idea or ability to complete or even get started on. And I don't know about you guys, but when you're faced with something that you have no idea how to do, the motivation to start doing that is very low. So what does probation look like in McHenry County? It looks a little bit like this. Some of these folks are still with us. Some of them have moved on to other things.
but it's a little bit of a different perspective and a different view on what probation is, right? Um, so what does that look like in practice within our department? What we try not to do is rely on the deterrence model. Essentially, this punish to deter future crime. Um, use of graduated sanctions, which you guys just kind of experienced. Demanding behavior change without explaining how to do it. Um, one size fits all work. Uh, or using external motivators to leverage change. Um, what we do try to do, though, is use a more rehabilitative model. And within that, we want to build rapport, professional rapport. We want to meet them where they're at and build them up. So maybe they don't have those skills that they need, but we're going to build them toward that. We want to encourage that behavior change while teaching. We want to develop their internal motivations to change. And while this all sounds kind of sometimes a little softer than the other approach, accountability is still very required with all of our clients. The court has put orders in place, and we have to make sure that they follow those as well. So um, how do we do all that? We risk assess uh, initially and over time. We collaboratively case plan with our clients. Um, we don't tell them what they need to do. We work with them and ask them and find out the things that we, our risk assessment tells us we need to work on, but also the things that will be beneficial for them. We enhance motivation and readiness for change. Uh, we teach skills, cost-benefit analysis, problem solving, the cognitive model, and then we role play and rehearse those with clients so that they have that opportunity to try it out with no consequences before they go and try that skill at home or with their boss or school or wherever. And we have always and will always make referrals for services that we can't provide, intensive outpatient, partial, partial hospitalization, or inpatient treatment. Uh, but as we do all those things, we, we create these pathways for success. It's not one pathway, it's individualized for the client. Um, sounds like a lot, a lot to do with all of our clients, so we are lucky to have the risk-need responsivity model to kind of guide us. And I will give you guys the very brief version on this. I, when we do risk assessments, first it tells us who we're working with. We can't do the, the most for all of the clients that come through the court system and come to us, so we have to kind of triage. Those who are the highest risk need the most service, and research tells us it's upwards of 300 hours before of direct intervention before a high-risk client starts to make any substantial changes to their thinking or their behavior. Whereas a low-risk client probably doesn't need anywhere near that, <coughs> and research would even suggest that for most of them, most true low-risk clients, uh, the least or the less we intervene, the better they'll do. They've made a mistake and they will self-correct. Our risk assessments also tell us what we need to focus on with those clients. So um, as we do the risk assessment, it identifies criminogenic needs that, um, I'll explain those on the next slide here, but those are the specific things that are going to either increase their likelihood of future crime or decrease if they're properly addressed. And responsivity, the, the second R there, is about kind of matching your style to the client um, and meeting them, as I said on the prior slide, where they're at um, to build them up. The greatest example I can give you guys of this is if we've got a client who is on with us for a drug offense, right? But that female client has a history of being a victim of domestic violence. Perhaps the best PO to partner that person with or the best treatment provider to compare them with is not a male, potentially. That's a responsivity issue. Another responsivity issue would be giving someone who is illiterate written homework to go do and bring back. They're not going to do it. So we have to match and customize to what the, what the client brings to us. Fidelity's up there because we are always measuring how well we're doing these things. When we follow the model and we follow the research, it's going to go well. When we get off, pace, off off of that, though, and we kind of go based on our gut or those kinds of things, it might go well, but it might not. Um, so we're always measuring and watching what we do uh, for fidelity. So I've talked a couple times about criminogenic risk, and the, that's different than general risk. But um, <coughs> these are the criminogenic risk factors that we target when we assess with clients and case plan. The very top three are, the, are often the most common, most frequent, biggest bang for your buck. If somebody has a criminal, criminal attitude or belief system, they're probably going to commit more crime. They're very comfortable with it. And so we should address it. 
if all their friends and family and peers are criminally involved. You can, you're up against the tough battle to get them to change. I've had clients that were gang members and everyone in their family was a gang member. Brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. If they have some of those personality traits, um, those by themselves will lend themselves to criminal behavior. And onward down the list there, but all of those things are our main targets when we're looking at what are we doing with these clients. Um, and when we do target those things specifically, and we don't just kind of go at whatever, um, we see these kind of results. One to two criminogenic risks uh, addressed means a 14 to 19% reduction in recidivism, recidivism being future crime. And when we target three or more, anywhere from 22 to 51% reduction. Um, that's worth the effort. As I said before, we can't do this with every single client that comes through, and that's why we triage and target those higher risk and moderate risk clients. How do we do it? Well, um, all of the officers, uh, including all of the management team here, myself as well, have been fortunate to be trained in effective practices in community supervision. This is one of the uh, premier techniques that are used in probation throughout the United States. Um, there are other versions of it in Canada and uh, in other parts of the world. But in essence, it is a, it's a, a different way of working with clients. We don't strong arm them. Um, we don't threaten them with potential consequences. We use relationship skills to build that rapport that I talked about before. We use assessment skills to risk assess, as I've discussed, but we're also teaching the client how to do their own analysis of their life with their behavioral analysis of my life until now. Because we're trying to teach them how to assess their situation. We only get usually somewhere between two to four years with these clients. We'd like them to never come back. If they don't have those skills, they'll probably keep making the same decisions they did before. Bridging skills we use when the client is kind of ambivalent or trying out these new, better, more pro-social behaviors. Um, and we can effectively reinforce those when they do well. We can also effectively disapprove of those when they don't make good choices. And then we teach intervention skills. Um, those kind of seem simple to us, a cost-benefit analysis, a pros and cons list, but our clients have never even seen that or heard of that before. Um, so just teaching them those skills again so that they can do that outside of our presence and outside of their time on probation so they can make better choices. Um, blended with uh, epics uh, is motivational interviewing. So um, I'll get, give you guys just the nutshell. On that. I'll let you read it, but essentially it is a different way of talking to clients. And when I say we're not giving them the motivation, we're eliciting it out of them. So a great example would be, I could tell you that you want to make change because it's important for your kids, right? Do I know that it's important for your kids? I don't. I'm not you. I'm not in your head. So I need to ask you, what reasons might you want to change? And if you tell me that it is your kids, great, now we've got something to work on, right? But if you tell me, mm, I want to, I don't know, I, I want to have my own house. I want to get a different job. Oh, those are different motivations that now I can work with you on those things rather than telling you what I think is important for you to make that change. So in a nutshell, that's kind of motivational interview. It's a lot of eliciting out. Um, <clears throat> so up to the prior slide was kind of more of a philosophical approach of how we do business. But as far as programs, um, and I do think it's an important distinction and why I chose this picture is many people confuse probation and prison or, or parole. Um, parole happens after prison, right? So they come through the court system, and if the court determines that they are appropriate and safe to be in the community, they come to us on probation. If the court determines that they are not safe and appropriate to be in the community, they go to prison and then they're on parole afterwards. That is not us, separate business. Um, but as far as programs, we have juvenile home detention and diversion. Um, so kids that commit serious offenses might go to de juvenile detention down in um, Kane County is where we use. Um, but we like to try and keep those kids there as little as possible. Um, Kane County houses seven other um, counties there, including uh, DuPage, Kane, uh, to Kendall, DeKalb. And a little, yeah, and a few others, I think, maybe southern ones. Uh, and so 
it's quite a mix of clients down there. We don't like to keep them. So we have home detention. And I brought a home detention uh, equipment. I don't have the bracelet, but it looks similar to something like this that goes on their leg. This one's actually a GPS bracelet. Um, but in that way, we can monitor them. Diversion is a separate thing. So when, when, a, when a minor is arrested, um, the police send over the police report, and one of the supervisors kind of takes a look at it and determines <coughs> if, the, if the minor and the case is appropriate for diversion. If it is appropriate, we don't even send it to court. We want to divert it from the court process, um, not have a record started for that kid or involve them in the criminal justice system. Um, and if they successfully complete probate, or diversion, rather, it goes away. Um, it may be in, in their record for the police to see, but there's never any court record of it. On adult, we have pretrial and conditions monitoring. Dan kind of talked about the Pretrial Fairness Act, and so um, we monitor people uh, while they're out pending their trial. Post disposition for juvenile, we have supervision and probation, which does include residential placements. Uh, where we have to place kids outside of the community uh, for sometimes upwards of one to two to three years while they receive treatment. Um, for adults, we have reporting supervision and CD, conditional discharge. Standard probation is the bulk of uh, the probation work that we do. And we do have problem solving courts, drug court, DUI court, and mental health court, which are all awesome. And as Dan said, we do encourage you to come see those graduations. Um, we also have a court monitoring program, so that handles any kind of that juvenile ordinance stuff, those smaller stuff that juveniles might do, or adults that um, isn't probation worthy or, or eligible, uh, usually lower level offenses, and so our office supervises those individuals as well, and that would, that's upwards of 2,500 to 3,000 clients a year through court monitoring. Um, as far as services, we do run moral recognition therapy groups. Moral recognition therapy is a cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, a number of my officers are trained facilitators of that. And we run a couple of men's groups, women's group, a DUI group, transitional age defender group for 17 to 24 year olds, and a juvenile group. We're working towards domestic violence and a sex offender group as well. This is 12 to 16 weeks of um, homework and then group discussion around the topics. It has a lot of peer accountability to it, but also a lot of teaching through the facilitators. Um, <clears throat> it's a wonderful group, um, and it really helps clients to see each other in a, in a healthy pro-social way, um, where they haven't before, maybe. And so um, that's something that we, we are very proud of. We do alcohol and drug testing. I brought um, two different kinds of tests for you guys to look at. I'll send them around. This one is an oral swab um, when clients can't go to the bathroom. Um, we do an oral swab. They're not our favorite thing to do, but take a look. Those are unused, so no worries. <laughs> and we also do uh, urine collection, also unused. But those look like that. Um, and we also offer a couple other kinds of uh, alcohol and drug testing. We have something called CAM. Um, it looks something like this, but it is CAM stands for um, Continuous Alcohol Monitoring. Um, and what that does is measure uh, alcohol in the perspiration of their, through their skin and tells us whether they've been consuming alcohol 24 hours a day. Um, we also have something called OSM. Uh, Outreach smartphone monitoring. Thank you. Um, and so this pairs with your phone and acts as a, like a breathalyzer. And so the the company that we use for this can, or the officers can set up um, any random schedule that they want for clients to be tested. I'll send that one around too. Um, and the clients are prompted through their phone through a text to go ahead and submit a breath sample, and they have to go ahead and do that. Um, it takes a video of their face while they're doing it through their phone and sends it to the monitoring company so that they can make sure that the client is doing everything that they can, they're supposed to do. Um, a real similar device to the OSM is our breathalyzer. We use these in the office and in the field to just monitor whether people are actively consuming alcohol. Um, those are wonderful. We can also drug test for alcohol consumption as well. As far as electronic monitoring, I mentioned that we do not have a home, uh, and what did I say here, RF, radio frequency, so we use that for home detention. Are they home? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are they home or are they not home? Um, 
we use GPS monitoring, which is this, and I will send this one around. So this 24-7, 365, they are monitored to know where they're at, what they're doing, where they're going. Um, GPS is commonly used in domestic violence cases where we're trying to protect a person or an address or a school or something like that. Um, and soon to come, we're looking at device monitoring. So with sex offenders, they're often uh, required not to access certain things on the internet, as you can imagine, and I won't say out loud. Um, but this this company will monitor that for us and let us know if clients are accessing that kind of information on the internet. Um, the department prepares social history investigations for the juvenile court and pre-sentencing investigations for the adult court on the criminal side. On the civil side, we do do adoption investigations as well. Those are few and far between, but we do. Um, <clears throat> I talked a lot about ethics before. We were, we are ahead of the state on that by about five years at least, and we definitely set the bar. The state uses a lot of our forms and process for their own. Now that they've adopted that, and so we really are the leader in the state on that, and we have the fortune of being able to participate with and, and collaborate with other departments. Peoria um, is coming up real soon to work with us on forming up an EVP unit within their department as well. Um, Public service work, so the court often orders public service as a condition. Um, we make site referrals to around the county. We also have um, on location immediately to the west of this building, the Maureen McIntyre Community Garden. So in 2017, that was um, created with a combination of staff, our officers, and, and probation, or probation clients, rather. Uh, in 2022, 225 pounds of produce that we we donated to local food pantry. I think it was Woodstock Food Pantry, yeah? Of course. <laughs> we'll spread it around in 23. Um, and when we can, we try and have clients help us with that donation as well because it, it helps them to feel like they're giving back to the community in a way. But the clients are out there watering and weeding and they stain the fence that's all around. Clients helped us to build this water catchment. Um, the, the rain barrels were um, donated by a brownie troop. Um, right before COVID, and it took a while to get those things in place. Um, <clears throat> this is what we look like as a department, as far as an organization. We are 43 in total, uh, which is 10 less than we were five years ago. I think we we're at 52. Um, we serve about 2,000 clients on probation a year, 3,500 through the court monitoring program, which equates to about 25,000 plus client interactions, just conversations. We do 1,500 investigations of various forms throughout the year to, for the court, 13,000 or more drug tests a year of various sorts. I love this next stat. We do about 150,000 hours of public service work per year. When our clients do that, um, at minimum wage, that equates to $1.9 million in work hours for non-for-profits in this community, and I think that's an amazing thing. Um, we have 120 clients or so that go through MRT each year, which equates to 2,400 sessions. And I think we're amazing. So <laughs> I'll turn it over to, oh, I do have, and I'll just leave these, so I don't need to explain them, but pamphlets about all of our different programming. And um, I will send the, I'll leave them with Pete for you guys to take a look, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. You do do an amazing job. I mean, you oh, guys really you. do. It's, 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 can I ask the, if, so I know in your conversations, how, how are we doing long-term planning? Because obviously, you know, there's going to kind of come a time again where the county grows and there's going to be more people and I'm going to assume caseload's going to increase. Do you have those kinds of conversations and is, are we prepared for those kinds of ultimate increases in, in providing services to a larger population, basically? I think we are. Um, we have worked really hard since Epix came in in 2015. To, that, that's not easy to do when you have a huge caseload. I understand, it's kind of so what, what I'm intimating. Yeah, and so what we did was um, we created low risk and administrative caseloads to take that off of the standard officers. And so, excuse me, whew, getting dry in the throat. Uh, <laughs> uh, my standard officers have a, about 50 cases apiece, which is a very manageable number um, compared to other areas around us. Um, we are always looking, though, at the weighting of the work that they do. Uh, part of why I have this team here is because we're, I'm always trying to succession plan and prepare for the future. 
And so um, we always have an eye to what's on the horizon. Um, the AOIC, our administrative body, has been very supportive of us because of our forward thinking with a lot of this epic stuff. And so if and when we need a position, we can, we can always ask for it. Uh, but we've been very conscientious to find that fine point between not having too too low of a number, but not having too high of a number of staff where we're you know, spending yeah. spending money and people are bored, frankly. Uh, I don't think anybody's bored over there. Right? No. 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 <laughs> no. Between the county having its initiatives, which are wonderful, and the state having a number of initiatives, yeah. we are always very busy. Pre-trial fairness being one example, but... Um, there's never a shortage of good ideas at the state level. It's Thank just you. what we can take on. Other questions? <clears throat> Mr. Seiger. Not a question, but just comments. Uh, Seth, number one, not that you're not a great guy, but your mom's one of my favorite people. So, um, But, you know, you, you've left me breathless over here. I mean, the amount of work that you all do, the magnitude of the demand is just unbelievable. And I, I have to tell you frankly I'm pretty ashamed that I am so ignorant about all of this I had no idea that such progressive approaches were being taken uh, so I am tremendously grateful for this opportunity to learn about this today you know you have shattered all of my TV beliefs with regards to probation and so I'm I'm truly truly grateful uh, for the positive example that you all and your leadership have provided for uh, for us as a county and certainly for the leadership that you provided throughout the state so man congratulations and uh, you know uh, Peter I don't we need to double their budget I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how they're getting it all done Kelly from finance is here I think there's a few other finance people so. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you I, uh, I will say that one of my objectives for this year is to get out into the community more and help people understand yeah, more absolutely. what we're doing. Yeah. Because I think it is amazing work that gets done there every day, and nobody knows. Yeah. And so um, all of these folks and all of the folks that report to them deserve right. to be recognized for that amazing yeah, stuff that they do. Well, congratulations and thanks. Ms. Wagner? So just, I know we um, target different departments sometimes on our social media. I think mm -hmm. it would be definite. Have you guys been targeted? Have you been videoed or? I don't think we've been videoed. We did have one of our employees who was in the, um, where's Alicia? We had Rachel she, for the employee spotlight, is that what that was? Um, and Alicia and I have been talking about um, the speakers bureau, right? Oh yeah. And getting out in front of that so that we can get out there more. Um, yeah, yeah, because I, I think it's important, absolutely. Great stories. Anything else? No, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank all of you. <laughs> <laughs>
I had a twist in arm to get McHenry on board this time, but anyways, they're in, and it's yeah. great. So, here's our organization. Um, there's myself, I have a, a Chief Deputy Director, Bob Ellsworth, who's leaving us. Um, he is retiring. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, there's a fear, since all of us are within three or four years of each other, um, and that's it, that's the office. Um, and I worry about it. I didn't think the youngest would leave first, but he's leaving. And um, we'll work with HR to try to bring somebody in there and have some overlap, but we're about to lose, lose 29 years of experience there. Um, and, you know, um, oh, except for the judge they left. You know, the, the state's attorney uh, um, always says, keep Dave out of orange, and it's Robin that does it. She does the, um, a lot of the paperwork, all the grant paperwork and what have you. And then we have a planner who, um, I, I'll show you some of the plans we have to work on. And, and the grant deliverables that we have lately have just become crazy. Um, I, I've been part of international associations. I was president of uh, International Association of Emergency Managers for our region. Um, I've done another thing. I talk with colleagues in other states, and it's funny how they read the grant deliverables versus how our state reads them. Um, ours always reads it to the nth degree, and we spend more time trying to satisfy grants paperwork-wise than we do actually serving people, and, and we're working on that. And I'll be talking with you through legislative to try to, to help us out there, but that, that group's the one that does it. And I forgot to mention, that whole, all the red is our volunteers, and that's the core. And those are the people you see. Um, and I, I have a list of some of the events that they do, along with the middle of the night disaster um, work that they do. Um, the, the other thing, and in, in, uh, you know, Chief Horst, he, he brought it up, is the work we do with the fire departments, police departments, municipalities, the townships, um, it's all behind the scenes. Um, and to try to make this just a better place to live. We had a good place when I got here um, 12 years ago, and we just try to make it a little bit better each day. So um, so here's what the five phases of emergency management. This is the things that we work on. And people ask me, what is emergency management? And you know, I, I want to show them the slide, but um, it's, not, um, it, it's not practical. Right? I, um, I, I used to explain to Scott, it's we come to play to either avoid the solid waste stream hitting the rotating device, or we come to play when it did, all right? Um, and and I, I heard it said differently, but I'll leave it there. So <laughs> <laughs> prevention is probably the big one, right? Prevention. Um, we do a lot of training, a lot of exercise. Um, by state law, I'm required a certain number of hours of training every year. Um, uh, Bob and I are both certified emergency managers, um, but the exercises, there was a, um, a FEMA administrator who got frustrated. We were at a international meeting, he got frustrated, he slammed his hands on his table, and he said, stop testing to pass. What we did is we set up our training, we set up our exercises to pass. And Craig Fugate taught me to, all right, how can we break the system so that the next time we are breaking it? Um, Incident Action Plan Review, um, we had the uh, Unified Development Ordinance change that if there is a event occurring in the county, in unincorporated, because we can't affect the municipalities, um, EMA has to sign off on that event, if, if it's over 2,000 people. And the reason why is Tough Butter really brought it. Um, it was held up at the Richmond Hunting, is it Richmond Hunting Club? Um, 5,000 people that were separated from their cars by five buses. And our big fear was weather would come in and how do we get them out of there. So we forced them to have an action plan and then we put it in the Unified Development Ordinance. It's, it's not just safety, and sec I mean not just security, it's also that safety. Because um, those people who were participating in that event, it's a obstacle course event, their cars were parked up at Country Thunder. And that the only way back and forth was those buses and you know there's always weather rolling through or something. So anyways, that's part of that incident action plan review. Moving across mitigation, which we're, we're deep into it right now. We have a meeting Thursday. Um, we have a lot of solid ideas, and I'm really excited with how it rolled out this time. Mitigation is the way to go, is to get rid of the effects of disaster or minimize the effects of disaster. 
Um, it affects your CRS rating for the county. We've improved it since I've been here. Um, uh, it, it's one of the factors for CRS. And CRS, what it means, community rating system, affects the insurance that our, our residents pay um, for both flood insurance and for their regular homeowners insurance. Um, we're involved for mitigation, a lot of regional planning. Um, we have an exciting group of Metro County coordinators. Um, this is, I've been a county coordinator or involved in, in EMA for over 20 years. The group that is now in Will and DuPage and Lake and Cook and, and here in McHenry and Kane, Kane's in a little bit of upheaval right now, is that's the team to go to war with right now. Um, it doesn't matter if it's Ted out of, out of Cook County or Allison out of Will County. It's forward thinking and, and we're involved. And we're actually mitigating things by things that we can do as a team together. Um, so anyways, response is the part you all hear about. Um, we were the second county and to have that emergency alert system. And that's where your phone pops off and you might have got a message that the courthouse was closed a couple months ago um, because of a snowstorm. Um, that's the system we did it through. The only reason we were the second county to allow be allowed to before is only the states and the National Weather Service. Is because our application got there just before Will County, so theirs was on top of ours, and they took theirs off the top before ours. But anyways, we were one of the first two to have the emergency alert. And it's the same system. Did anybody hear about Hawaii when they triggered the alert that the incoming? It's that same system, right? And actually, the the uh, Emergency manager from Honolulu is a friend of mine. We went to the academy together, and uh, um, he said if anybody was going to do it, it was that guy, that guy that did it. Um, and it wasn't the first time he'd done it. Um, this time, he got to take his walking papers. But <laughs> letting the community know. And here's the other side of that, and why I'm dwelling on it is, it's one thing for me to say evacuate or shelter in place, right? It's another thing for somebody to hear it or to pay attention to it. And as an emergency manager, um, my own parents are a problem with this. They used to live in Florida. They lived within 25 miles of the Gulf. There's a hurricane coming there. <laughs> I have friends there. They said it's going to be bad. Go, get out, you know? And of course they didn't. Um, and of course their house was trashed and they were scared and what have you. And um, being a good son, I didn't say told us Um But I did ask if they were hungry bridge was out. But anyways, um, but it's messaging so people hear you. And it's not just the emergency alert. It's the messaging about preparedness and what have you. And that's, we have to up our game, but that's that's a huge part of our response is, is letting people know that there's a problem and to react to it. And then recovery. Recovery takes a long time. Coordinator down in Randolph County, Illinois, um, one of the Mississippi floods, 93 flood. Um, 19 years after the flood, they closed out the paper. That's recovery. Um, we've all been through it, right? Um, and it takes a long time. And that's where emergency management's in and bringing in the right resources or lining it up. I ran out of this room when that one applicant said something about they have to get their COVID paper in. And that, it, he's almost too late. Well, I went out there. It turns out they have their paperwork in. What is there's questions from FEMA about what they did. I was really concerned that Harvard was out. And I got to tell you, we called every town, we called every township, every fire department, get, get it and get it, and here's the rules, here's the rules, and the rules kept changing throughout COVID. But when he said that, I thought they hadn't turned anything in, and, and technically they could have been out because it's hard to get that stuff together. It, it, they're going to be okay, I think. Um, and anyways, and then preparedness. And that's our emergency operations plan. It's part of our accreditation. Um, our standing operating procedure. Um, we started the coordinating council not long after I got here, and that it, it was a bigger body. COVID kind of really throttled it back. People didn't want to kind of get together or something, or we couldn't. Um, and that's police and fire, and municipal and the Red Cross and Salvation Army and some other NGOs getting together to talk about things that um, that matter to the county. Um, I, the issue I have with it sometimes is it doesn't resonate with everybody every time, right? And I brought in you know, speakers from around the country to talk to that coordinating council. And we meet about once a quarter. We've had the slack down right now because we're so big into the uh, hazard mitigation plan. But we'll pick it back up and it'll be a lot of those people on that team that will be part of that coordinating council. Um, and then um, we have some other ways of talking to people or preparing and McHenry Aware app. And sometimes we forget we have it. You know, you have these tools. Um, we're getting better about social media. 
What I love now is that many other departments are on social media, so when they see our stuff, they mirror our stuff, and then we mirror their stuff, and so we try to get out to the population. Um, we, uh, EMA, here uh, pioneered use of Nextdoor in the county. Um, we have 44,000 people in the county that are on Nextdoor. So when we send a message out there, be careful because we get some weird responses on next door. People are used to garage sales and there was a coyote in my backyard or um, somebody was speeding and that's it, right? And then all of a sudden you put something on there for emergency management, hey, <laughs> disaster relief. At, you know, I, well, yeah, you get interesting comments, but it does have a large reach out throughout the county. I think DOT was adding an account. I didn't know if, um, um, but in next door, normally you join the neighborhood and you're only, you know, you're 10 neighbors or something. What we're allowed to do as a government entity is our whole jurisdiction. So we can hit all the borders. And it's the only social media platform we have that type of thing. I think Facebook, we have a few thousand people that watch us there. And Twitter, I don't play with Twitter at, at all. Um, but Twitter has um, a number of followers. Um, we follow Twitter in our office um, because we look for trends, things that are happening. Last two years ago, three years ago, there was the, must have been before COVID, there was the school bombing being called in, or bomb threats being called in. And by us monitoring Twitter, we knew it before we got a notification from the State Terrorism Intelligence Center. And then we started calling our districts to say, have you been involved? And um, I think five of our districts had been involved in that. There's a nationwide effort by some cyber somebody or another. Um, our volunteers, I mentioned them before. Um, these are some of the things that they get involved in. Um, it's the a simulated emergency test, it's a radio drill, um, national night out, they've gotten more involved in the different towns. Um, that town just north of Crystal Lake um, invites us all the time. Um, and uh, um, the fair, we're there. And we, we used to do some different things. Now we do a lot of intel for the weather. And I don't know if you noticed the change in the weather lately when there's something bad coming in, they may not say coming to Woodstock. They may say McHenry County Fair is in the path of a storm. And that's because we register every event that's occurring in the, in the county, whether it's a municipal event or ours. And what the weather service does is they reprogram their, aside from mentioning cities that might be in the way, if there's a fair or event or whatever, they actually specifically call that out. And you know it's surprising, people live here for years and they don't realize what town they might be in. So yeah, they know they're at, you know, Harvard Milk Days. <laughs> and um, so <laughs> if, if uh, you know, they know they're at the county fair and so changing that, and it's interesting how it does. And that goes back to that thing of sending a message, but are people hearing it? And, and anyways, so one of our partners, and, and it's been a great partnership, except they keep lying about that weather coming in that doesn't come in when it finally comes in. But, um, This is some of the equipment that we have. Um, the generators I got on a grant, it was a statewide grant. We're actually, we're considered custodians of the generator. Um, so we didn't pay for them, and they didn't give them to us. But we take care of them, and we can use them for whatever happens. Most recently, Seacom, their generator at the uh, dispatch in, in Crystal Lake, um, their generator blew apart, or parts of it blew apart. and. So we had already worked with them for a couple of years to port that building, and all they had to do was plug in our generator, and it was there for, for quite some time um, as they, they sorted it out and got it all fixed up. Um, and then some of our search and rescue gear and our, our small command post. Um, we just went through our threat hazard identification um, and risk assessment, and I wanted you to see this. Um, it used to be flooding, it used to be wind. We're all up there. They don't even hit the radar anymore compared to what cyber means to us. Um, we, Scott and I, he left, um, just went to a training on that. We met with IT. We're in very good shape here, but never say never. Um, it's still a huge threat. And the big thing is the things we don't have control over. We don't have control over electricity, and I don't want control over electricity, but, but I don't control their systems. I don't control their cyber security or gas or water or whatever. Right. So anyways, we take that seriously and then adjust our planning efforts of, of how we go. Um, funny how pandemic moved up there. It used to always be number 19 or something, but I guess it moved up a bit. Um, 
So here's the planning initiatives that we're involved in. Um, most of them are multi-year, the natural hazard mitigation plans every five years, our emergency <coughs> operations plans every three years. Um, but um, I'll move on. I, I know you guys um, need to get out of here. But this is the bulk of our work day to day. This is the 80% of what we're doing as a plan. And every one of these plans has partners involved. None of them are EMA plans. So it, whether it's the, um, you know, our, our comprehensive emergency management plan, which encompasses every department in the county, um, uh, whether it's for COOP or for CAG. Um, and that's the interesting part of our work is all of the, the people we get to work with and um, that contribute to the plan. Um, as a mitigation, um, it, as Carolyn's related to you, it's a big one. And here's some of the things that, you know, it does. You know, acquisition of home, elevation utilities, building codes, public education. And I just found out a new one it, that they didn't used to allow it. They'll pay for a generator and a hazard mitigation grant if you declare that that building, that public building, is used for a warming center, cooling center, or shelter. I didn't know that before two days ago when one of our townships asked about it. Um, that's huge, you know, generators cost. Those ones in the barn, the big one, uh, is about $100,000 worth of, that we've spent on it, either to acquire it, or the state to acquire it, and us to maintain it, right? That's a huge grant, and that could really come in handy, um, should we need it. And that recent storm where we lost almost, I think we were over 20,000 customers in McHenry County were without power for some length of time, and some for 36, 70 to 72 hours. So. Anyways, some of the things that has a mitigation can be used for. The, the best one that I like, to me it's the cheapest, it's the easiest, it's the one that makes the most sense is the living snow fences. And we work with DOT to try to get the funding on with that. Um, they're, they're better fund chasers than I am, but between the two of us, we, we do pretty good with that. Um, and then natural hazards, right? It's that plan, unfortunately, is just natural hazards, um, but we can think beyond that. So. You know, um, location, the river, probably, flooding, what have you. What's that risk of our population being affected? Um, the built environment. Um, it, uh, I'm, I'm going to get to another slide in a second, but um, what's our natural environment, you know, that's contributing to the whole problem of, you know, there might be damage. So I wanted to give you this. This is the 2017 flood to give you an idea of what happened, and most people don't know it. Um, this. It's kind of, this is a weird thing. And I remember when I told Carolyn, she said, what? <laughs> so, no, the house is insured. Those are houses that were touched by water, right? Somehow damaged by water by this flood in 2017. So, they are a negative in the great FEMA scan, um, FEMA apartment, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no dollars for them. There's nothing. And FEMA only looks at your losses for uninsured losses. Right. The other thing that works against us is the fact that we have a large city state just southeast of us, right? Because of the population there. I need to show, for public assistance for government, I have to show $1.3 million in damage to government facilities. We used to be able to do it easier because we were self-insured. Now FEMA's taking another look at it. Well, you are insured, and it's, it's a weird thing to play with right now. Our residents, although there's not supposed to be a threshold, there's a number of homes. Now, what we usually will qualify in the flood is um, SBA, uh, Small Business Administration. We need to have 25 homes that are uninhabitable, and that means 50% or more damage. Um, but that's a loan. That's not a grant, right? Like a disaster. So, anyways, in this disaster, uh, you know, we mapped it out and. and our GIS department's great. They had it all mapped out in dots and blinks and whatever on the screen, and it was really great. But give you an idea what happened. So, but what I want to talk about was social media. We did social media mining because a lot of people in our county don't admit that they got flooded because of whatever reason. They don't want an insurance claim. They don't want people to know, whatever. But it's important for me to know, to communicate to the state, we got a big problem here, right? So what we did is we looked at social media, and when we saw a well, there's a lot of people in Johnsburg saying they got flooded, but I only have three homes that we've assessed, right? We're able to look at that and then go look, take a closer look and see that it was flooded. So we used it. Um, we used over 300,000 sandbags. Um, we don't fill them. 
we give them, uh, we acquire them from the U.S. Army Corps, and we give them to mainly townships, and the townships utilize them, um, and some of the other stats. But I want to give you an idea of some of the th other things that are happening behind the scenes with the disaster and how we get, we get to uh, to do it. That picture in the top right um, is a family assistance center. It's the first time we did it here in Montgomery <coughs> County, and it, I don't know whose concept it was, but. What it does is it brings all the parties that somebody who's affected by a disaster may need together. Everything from um, the Secretary of State to give them a new driver's license if they lost it, to um, uh, the, um, not the state's attorney, the uh, attorney general was there for insurance fraud, everything in one place. And what you do is you don't send them in their blind. Because my world is a world that most people don't understand or only understand it when they get hit by it, right? Um, so each, each family unit is given a tour guide to take them through, because they might not know that they need to stop here. I found out here that every veteran affected by the flood, every flood we've had, is entitled to, it's between $100 and $500 by virtue of being a veteran. They don't have to have any paperwork or what have you. And those are some of the things you learn in the Family Assistance Center. There's a lot of helpful programs that people just aren't aware of, so we put them all in one room. And this 2017 flood was the first time we utilized that. Um, our emergency operations center, um, we like to keep that dark. Um, this happens to be a training that we did just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we like to keep it dark because that means that the solid waste stream hasn't hit that rotating device. Um, COVID-19 response, those some numbers. I sent the packet out to you, so I won't read this out to you, but um, it, it was a busy two and a half years, and it was, it was an aggravating two and a half years. Um, and, um, Aggravating that a lot of people that we're partners with, uh, there was tension, you know, and, and, and fortunately I think we've mended a lot of fences since then, but there were some challenges as we went through there. What was great is this team here in McHenry County, we met at first every single day as this thing rolled in. Then it got to be three times a week and then once a week. And But we stayed together as a team trying to figure out how we're gonna solve whatever we needed to solve for McHenry County. Um, and that's it. That's uh, kind of McHenry County Emergency Management. The only thing I'll ask, um, David, is, you know, what we hear all the time is that what you learned and the information you now have with all of the partners um, during that pandemic, that we're evaluating and we're determining where we did well and where we didn't well, and to be prepared, I, I was reading, yeah. to be prepared for any new eventual pandemic type situation. And you know, I, I mean, I deal with public health all the time, dealing with all of that. I, I know that you're well aware of it. I just, we need to call it out that we should be evaluating all of that data and be coming up with an up-to-date plan and enumerating and sharing with people what we did well and what we, what we have now corrected. So, you know, this is, a challenge for me, not doing what you just said. I understand. When I go to an exercise and I'm with police and fire and public works, and after the exercise, I say, you screwed that up. Okay, we don't say it that way, but say much nicer, right? You we're, it. we're comfortable, we're comfortable with that talk. And I call it a hot wash, a lot of guys call it, and the gals call it a hot wash. Um, it's an after, it's, it's that thing that we do right after. Um, but we're used to that with the group that we had as a pandemic. There are people that are not used to that, right? And we have to mute our words or we have to be very careful, right? Um, in, with the fire chief, with Rudy, after a fire, we can talk about, you know, I shouldn't have done this or he shouldn't have done that or we could have worked better. And we both get it, right? And so I don't want to alienate people further but I look to you to help me to, how do we communicate that, that here's how we could have done it better, right? With, with people that aren't used to hearing, what, I didn't do anything wrong. Two, <laughs> or, two, again, two, or my perception of what they did. Two separate, yeah. two separate, I think that there's an evaluation, yeah. Yeah. and then there's how we communicate that and how we share that information. So kind of two different pathways, but sure. yes, obviously. Yeah. Anyone else have any comments, questions? Mr. I just want to say thank you. I, I think, David, you've done a remarkable job of really, really working hard to communicate to, to the leadership within the county. Thank you. And I'm talking about municipal leadership as well as, uh, you know, the county. 
in townships, etc. But thank you, you've done a great, great outreach. I appreciate that. I, and I, I felt we were struggling, and, and then she brought Shaylin on, and that that's a force multiplier of that communication. Mm -hmm. Exponentially, right. Mm -hmm. um, it really has helped. Because I have the message. <laughs> I know I know who I want to talk to, right? Village president? But last week it was Mr. Smith, and this week it's Mrs. Jones, right? And that that's a challenge. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, know that I'm working harder on how do I make sure that no matter which who is there, that I, I reach out to them. That is one thing I will say is that, you know, the elected officials change all of the time. Now, not the personnel, the staff doesn't necessarily change sure. all the time, but they yeah. still change. But the one thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is the fact that, you know, the, the leadership of the municipalities or the townships or the major institutions, whether they're health organizations or whether they're the McKinney County College or whatever it is, they're not always trained in terms of what their responsibilities are, what they should be doing, because the people within those institutions, those organizations are very accustomed to looking to that person for leadership sure, sure. in every situation. So now all of a sudden it's an emergency situation. They're looking to that person to provide that leadership. They're not necessarily looking to David no. because they don't know David, but they know this other individual. And so I, I think maybe we need to have routine communications with all of the, and I'm not saying that you don't, but I'm saying even more so training type of thing sure. um, about what we do because like you said, those people change. I know that we are responsible for that. College is responsible for that, everybody, so. And the challenge is not the having the training, the challenge is getting people to the training. Exactly, right. Yeah. right. Ms. Campbell? Yeah, I was going to say that. That yes. is the challenge. And yes. I'm actually thinking that maybe um, we could be <coughs> doing a better job of reaching out to our counterparts so that they get somebody there. Again, the communication right. of finding out right. who that is and getting at Because we right. did that with Stormwater, too. And I, and I, I don't want to stop the conversation, no, but I'm going to stop the conversation. Thank you. We'll continue. Sure. I'm we'll glad continue. I was finally able to do it. We, 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 <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and and I'm going to apologize to all of you. It is quarter to 12. I wanted to be done way before this. I need to leave. I would like, if, if it's okay with you, to have Alicia come up, give us a legislative update. She did have a written report, which I have distributed to you. And I just slipped a note to Peter that said, in the future, what I would like is during session, I would like to bump up the legislative report to a higher position on the agenda. We never get there, and this is kind of important as session is going on. So I would ask for that consideration as we move forward um, the next couple months, and then, of course, during veto. Otherwise, it's not so crucial because that's just us developing our, our own program. So real quickly, again, Alicia, you've got the floor. Thank you so much. As Pam stated, this is a critical time right now in the Illinois General Assembly. We are right between um, two deadlines. Um, the first uh, just occurred on March 24th, and that was the third reading deadline for House bills. The next one comes up this Friday, which is for the Senate. So for our purposes, we um, the House Bill 2800, the bill that is being forward to assist with Randall Road, did make it through third uh, reading. And it was snapped up immediately by Senator DeWitt and is now in assignments in the Senate ready for allocation. So that's the big thing you need to know on part one. Part two, House Bill 2781. So this bill has had a deadline extended, so it's still in play right now. Um, and it is going to get more money to townships so that the county does not have to allocate as much to repair roads and bridges. So this, this bill has had subject matter hearing postings as opposed to schedulings, and it's been kind of pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. I will, I do inform you, um, I did in consultation with Chair Altoff and with um, County Administrator Austin, I did put a, a slip in on behalf of the county um, that we are in support of this legislation. So wanted to and, and I should build on that. that that's kind of the, the process that we'll go through during session on legislation that fits within our agenda you know, our, our adopted agenda and any other bills that we have discussed that we are in support of is just, again, in consultation with the county administrator, Chairman Bueller, and myself, we'll go ahead and decide whether we slip in or not slip in. Um, and again, I remind all of you, as time goes on, a lot of these bills that have had subject matter hearings may, be, be, may become part of another bill later in the session. You know, so that it's an amendment, and not a standalone, um, and which is why they conduct the subject matter hearings all the time. So, thanks. 
Um, another piece that you all should know is about um, LGDF funding. So unfortunately, the three bills that were put forward that actually did make the last committee deadline um, did not make it past this current one. Now, of course, as Pam will always remind me, deadlines are a little bit fluid, but they help kind of keep pace of, they kind of help you get an idea of what's rising to the top. So again, um, these, three, these three bills, though, House Bill um, 2087, SB 2206, and SB 180 also did get a good deal of sponsors, and our legislators were at our backs. You know, they, they really pushed hard to get the, these, these pieces of legislation going. So again, um, I will keep an eye on these going forward. And we did also put in a slip on this one, one of, on, sorry, I'm talking a little fast here. I did put a slip in, in, again, in consultation for House Bill 2087, because it did have a subject matter hearing coming up, allegedly. So just wanted to keep you up to date on that. Um, I did, uh, back on LGDF, uh, Shailen is doing a Zoom meeting with some other college directors on Thursday with Gordon, Leader Gordon Booth, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Um, other things that are, uh, I know that there was a little bit of concern about House Bill 3731. I was able to get in contact with Representative Gosti about that one. This bill talked about expanding the township dissolution um, legislation that impacts only McHenry County to the entire state. So again, I did speak with him about that. Um, it is not moving forward in this session, and there were some fixes in it, and I did provide him with the documentation on McHenry County's position and what we, and the faults that we found in the legislation. So, you know, he has a greater perspective on it as he, he looks forward with it in the future. Also, um, Administrator Austin and the Chairman did meet with Senator Severson and Representative Sosnowski yesterday. They did get to discuss um, LGDF and the Township um, funding issues. Um, they also got to discuss um, environmental matters with the Conservation District as well. And, uh, of course, if you would like to elaborate on that, please feel free. Um, also, we did assist, uh, and when I say we, I mean myself and um, Shailen Daigle, the County Coordinator. We were happy to um, help assist the Sheriff's Office as they put forward grant applications to Congresswoman Schakowsky, Congressman LaHood, and Senator Duckworth for funding for the Sheriff's Training Center. Try to keep that brief. Any questions? Great job. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I apologize to all of you. I really do. I was late and I'm leaving early and I shouldn't be doing that, but I'm going to turn the meeting over to Vice Chair Jordan um, and I'll catch up and make sure that I'm paying attention to what the information it is. So thank you. Um, You're on tap. Oh. The next presentation. Please. Child, yes. Please. Child, State's Attorney's Office update. Yes. Crime against children uh, task force. And this, this is this is an issue that did not require coming to the committee. I did, you know, there, there's a there's a new hire involved here. I did speak with state attorney leadership last week about where they're going to be doing the hiring and at what point and it's within our salary administration policy. But it was important to to Patrick and his staff that we talk about this because it's important stuff. So it really is important. <laughs> um, and, and really, I'm going to make this quick because. I, uh, Norm was going to actually be here for this, but it uh, fell over his vacation. So, um, uh, and uh, Randy and Patrick are involved in something right now. So, um, I will try to answer any questions you have. But Patrick really felt that it was important to um, just keep you guys up to date with what we were doing with our um, investigators, the two investigators that we asked for. In the budget process for 2023, we asked specifically for these investigators um, uh, related to the Safety Act. Um, they were granted to us, which we thank you very much. And um, the Safety Act is very much up in the air right now. There's a lot of, um, you Re know, the retail fairness component. Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so we're still waiting. We could wait a day. We could wait a month. We could wait a year. I mean, it's the Supreme Court, so it could. We don't know what's going to happen. We know we're ready when it does. We know that there'll be something that we'll be responsible for. Um, we may not um, have to um, have as much. The investigators might not have as big a role as we originally thought. However, in the meantime, one of Patrick's, um, you know, even from before the um, AJ uh, friend case, um, Patrick had sent about a year before a letter to the DCFS, uh, DCFS headquarters um, in Chicago with 
you know, just recognizing these huge issues. And um, so he's had this on his plate for a long time. We were able to, with the added two investigators, um, and our team now is five investigators, we are um, going to have them located at the CAC, which is the Children's Advocacy Center in uh, Crystal Lake. One of our, our chief investigator um, also is connected there. So what's going to happen with these two investigators, and this is really what Patrick wanted you to know, is we uh, have started a Crimes Against Children Task Force. And one of the things that happened with, um, I'll use the AJ case for example, because everybody's familiar with that, um, is there were a lot of um, incidents, but they were in different police jurisdictions, and that information didn't connect. So with our Crimes Against Investigators Task Force, that information will all go directly. Crimes against to, children. Or, yeah. Crimes against children. I'm trying to rush and I'm trying to think. I wasn't, I, like I said, I wasn't. Important distinction. Land, I'm doing this. But um, the information will all be connected in one spot. They'll be based there. We um, just hired the two people for these positions who will start end of May um, and first week in June. They both have 25 years plus as police officers <coughs> and uh, the one who will head it up. Um, which is in that lead investigator uh, position, has um, worked with the Child's Advocacy Center directly for many, many years as well. So um, we, we feel really good about this and um, putting, putting them to good use, something that we've been wanting to do for a while, but we haven't had the manpower. So um, we've done it a little bit, but we've never been able to put together a task force like this. So. Uh, we feel like this is going to, um, con you know, it's going to be all those connectors in McHenry County. It will also hold DCFS more responsible, and um, uh, and that will start. Literally, we've already got uh, most of it in process. As soon as they start, we also added one of our attorneys now works three days a week at the CAC as well, right from there. Her office is located there as well. So. Um, that's about it. Uh, if you have any more specific questions, I know Patrick would be happy to talk to you about this as well. I'll try to answer whatever I can. Cool. And just real quickly, you have currently five, and this is two more. Is that no, no, no. no five we had inclusive? three. We had we three. had one full time and two part time. We had a two full time, and we split two. Okay. So we have technically we have five bodies for yeah. investigators now with the added two. With the added two, got it. All we right. All, we had three before, but. Two of them were part time. Okay. All right. So, um, and and when and if the um, when the safety act ruling comes about, we know that we'll still need them to um, uh, some of their duties will have to be responsible to that. But we still have enough um, uh, staff now to create this task force and get it working. So, so we're we're. Um, combining the two. And Patrick just wanted you to be aware of that because we originally asked um, for the two investigators um, in last year's budget process to uh, make sure we were prepared for safety, which we still will have to be prepared for. We just don't know when everything is going to happen and, and what that balance, that scale of balance will be. So. so all of those individuals are housed at the CAC facility? No, no, no. Three of them are, but three of them are at our office. Um, one though goes back and forth right now. That's the three that okay. we've always had. Okay. Um, what happens is, is any time a child's brought in, right. we want them represented. There's always um, an attorney there at the CAC when a child is interviewed. Um, they were located right by our office. Last year, the CAC moved to Crystal Lake which is hard. I mean, sometimes our attorneys are there three times a day. So they're back and forth, back and forth. So having one house there was crucial to, um, you know, so on the day, we have one there three days a week, on the other two days, then they can go back and forth. But it's, it's much less of a burden on our office uh, with having them housed there. And then we have one, our part-time and chief investigator works between both offices. Now with the two new ones that will start in May, June, they will be located there, they, that, they will okay. be housed there completely five days a week. 
I mean, they'll come in and check in for meetings and things, but basically right. their offices will be there. The CAC is working with us to give us the room there. We don't have to pay any rent or any kind of, um, we, we are supplying their equipment, their computer equipment, but that's all we have to supply, even phones and things like that, they are supplying. Yeah. Um, we'll, uh, we'll supply their cell phones and any kind of equipment, but um, other than that, uh, the CAC is giving us the space for free. Thank you. Anyone else? I appreciate it. I really, this was Thanks just minute, last yeah, minute no, this morning, you. so I'm sorry if I, I I'm, not an I'm not an attorney, so um, uh, if you have any more specific questions, I'm sure uh, Patrick uh, or Randy Green will be able to answer your questions about the task force, but we're really uh, very, I hate to use the word excited, but we are excited to have this addi addition to McHenry County, I think it's going to make a huge difference in in um, that area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, executive session? One, no. I have one more item for everybody. Uh, when we post the uh, county board agenda, uh, we will be adding one other item under new unfinished business, unfinished business that would have come to this meeting today. It was not ready. It's the uh, intergovernmental agreement to add the city of Crystal Lake to the Sheriff's Narcotic Task Force, and they'll be joining Lake in the Hills, Woodstock, and McHenry. Uh, uh, it's, just, it's a no-cost issue, but it does get us more manpower and, and more intergovernmental work, so that'll be added to the agenda. Uh, Sandra is out of town this weekend and was not able to pull all the other last week. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, I need a motion to adjourn. Carolyn, second. Mr. Cumber. All in favor? Any opposed? Please <laughs> 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 buy a lunch, Mike. <laughs> 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 I don't know if it's on my email, but your yeah. dad is ready to be picked up across the street. Yeah, I did see that. Thank you so much.